Hello, everybody, and welcome to Friends of the Force, a Star Wars podcast. I'm your host, Brad Whipple, and joining me on the show is my wonderful co-host, Sarah Haas. Sarah! Hey! Welcome! Hi! What's up? How's it um, going? It's going so good. I am so excited to be here, as always, to finally talk about this book. <laughs> oh, which book are we talking about today, Sarah? Um, So, like, there's a series, um, and I, I want to... If, correct me if I'm wrong on the title. I think it's called Alphabet Squadron. It's, I mean, there's, it's a weird name. <laughs> but there's now been like three books and we're on the last one. And it's called Victory's Price, which sounds really ominous. But we're here to talk about that one, I guess. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. very excited. So that is what we're discussing today. And it's been a long time coming. If you yeah. haven't already <laughs> listened to our previous coverage on this series, we did an episode last summer. We talked about Shadowfall, and we also did an interview. I did an interview with Alexander Freed, so make sure you go check those out before you listen to today's episode or after. Up to you entirely, but we are just so excited to wrap up this trilogy and talk all about it. But before we get into that, Sarah, yeah, we're going to kind of just talk about some some fun news that has come up recently, which, by the way, how how are you enjoying award season? We're big <laughs> movie buffs. <laughs> oh my gosh. Couldn't help. But, like, cry any time somebody made a speech. <laughs> I couldn't help it. And I think it's because the Oscars last year were, like, my last bit of normalcy that I can really pinpoint before the world kind of flipped around. Mm-hmm. And I love award season so much. And the Oscar nomination voting is open, like, yeah. as of today. So, like, that, as of today, if we're recording it, recording us on Friday. So... Ah, it's that's crazy. Exciting. And so I'm excited. I mean, the best thing about award season is when we get to see all the stars of Star Wars come out. Like last year, we had Ryan Johnson <laughs> with yeah. his poor cufflinks. Um, but you're probably wondering, folks, like, why are we talking about award season? This is a Star Wars podcast. Well, I just want to give a big congratulations to Golden Globe winner John Boyega, because like Yay! that's kind of a big deal. Congratulations on winning a Golden Globe. He won for Best Performance by an Actor in a Television Supporting Role for Steve McQueen's Small Axe. So, like, that's a really big honor. He's uh, one of the uh, many Star Wars actors who are award winners, you know, amongst the the likes of Laura Dern and Alec Guinness and all the greats who've, you know, earned awards throughout their time, whether it's an Emmy or a Golden Globe or an Oscar. So he's joining that Star Wars royalty, you could say, which I'm really uh, excited about. Have any of the Star Wars people won an, a Tony? You know, that's a good question. I don't... Hmm. Maybe but, like, maybe uh, Ian McDermott, you know, maybe won a Tony. Who oh, I, there, so he, he was in a show at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater, and he showed up in their program when, on their membership page, and it was like... It, it, I forget what play it was, but it's him, and he's huh. like at the head of the table, and he's toasting this table, and I was like, that's Ian McDermott. That's awesome. I'm he sad I missed legend. that. He is he such is. a legend. Yeah. Well, that was just really awesome to see. And even though awards shows are now virtual, it's still kind of nice to have them back in our lives. Mandalorian was nominated for Best Drama Series at the Golden Globes. Did not Mm -hmm. win, unfortunately, but it was up against some pretty uh, tough competition. But nonetheless, it's really cool to see it get nominated for some stuff. And, you know, I'm just super excited to see, you know, what comes about during uh, Oscar season. You know, who might get nominated for stuff? I think Riz Ahmed, Bodhi Rook himself, is probably going to get a a uh, best uh, supporting actor nomination at the Oscars for Sound of Metal which if you haven't watched it folks and you love Riz Ahmed please watch that film it's like actually incredible it's it's like jaw dropping it's so good yeah you're reminding me I should have watched that a month ago when we said we were going to watch that and then I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oops but also hey, like I I do want to plug yeah I mean I do want to plug Small Axe because um Steve McQueen is one of the greatest and you won't see his name pop up in some of the awards later this season because I don't think Amazon Prime put small the Small Axe films towards the Oscars because I, I guess they're stupid but like you know either way uh check out Small Axe some incredible work by by Steve McQueen and all of the many many actors who um were involved in that project. Yeah, absolutely. So award season is here and we are ready to go. Now, yes. speaking of, of awards <laughs> and handing out honors to various creative projects, let's talk about the High Republic. So, Sarah, last time you and I got together, we talked about Claudia Gray's Into the Dark. Mm-hmm. So for those of you who are big High Republic fans and have read that book, go check out our spoiler discussion that we did two weeks ago. 
And that was a lot of fun. That was like one of my favorite episodes that we've uh, recorded together. So Into the Dark is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, It's amazing. It debuted number one on the young adult list, number six on the indie bookstore bestseller list. Hey, we love indies. That pretty much makes every single book that's come out a New York Times bestseller. If anybody tries to tell you the High Republic is failing, they are totally factually wrong. And they are probably trolls that you don't want to be involved with. So this is great. I I love how well these books are doing. And, you know, just under a couple months from now, we're going to have even more. And we're going to be back talking about The Rising Storm, about Daniel Jose Older's middle grade novel, Jesse in Ireland's YA book. Like, we're going to be back, Sarah. And we're going to be just really having a good good old time. I'm excited. I am so excited because these books have been so much fun thus far. And I am so excited that they are getting... The love they deserve, um, and are people are finding them and people are reading them and people are enjoying them and that's and, and I'm loving them. It's such a good feeling all the way around. Good Star Wars publishing vibes. And when you think about the uphill battle they've had to face in terms of marketing during a pandemic, mm-hmm. and like getting these books out and getting people wanting to buy them, that is really, really, really hard when you think about it. And I think if anything, like all of these books being on the best selling lists goes to show that this sort of initiative is working for Star Wars publishing. And I hope it kind of sends a signal to Lucasfilm that like, hey, people like crave these sort of interconnected stories that feel like they matter, that feel like they build on each other. You know, even though the kind of side novels every now and then, like a Phasma or like a uh, Inferno Squad, like those are all great. But I think really like people want the sort of like interconnectivity That's, you know, akin to something like a Marvel Cinematic Universe, but like in publishing form, because that's just kind of how people are consuming media now. It's how the Mandalorian is starting to go with this sort of more wider universe story. And I think if we could do that in publishing, which is already such a strong medium to begin with, that's something really cool. And I think people want to like, you know, invest in stuff that's going to have longevity. So hopefully we get more stuff like this out, even outside the High Republic, once the High Republic's done. So, you know. Yeah, and I think people want to invest in longevity and and know, and I mean, I think this is a little bit of a double-edged sword because standalone novels and individual stories, I think, are also valuable and important in their own yes. right, and um, that should also be valued, but it is exciting that people want longevity and um, like want to know that their, what they're reading now is going to continue to matter, um, and while that is a double-edged sword, it is also exciting because we know um, that we're going to be getting years of this High Republic initiative, and that's really very exciting. And I think what's also really what the bestseller list shows and what I'm seeing from people who are buying this, these books is that people are really excited about a new era and that people are really willing to get invested in something new, something away from Um, the Skywalkers and the timeline that we know. And that makes me feel really good too, because it gives me hope that Star Wars can live on beyond the 30, 40, 50, 60 years that we have experienced in it thus far within the Disney era or what is considered, you know, canon these days. Yeah. And if you're worried about Yoda still being involved in the High Republic, let me tell you, I just got through reading Daniel Jose Older's comics. Great stuff going on in those books. And Yoda even though he is kind of connected to the Skywalker saga, he is introduced and his presence is kind of uh, more supportive, if, if anything else. And it is kind of nice to have a little bit of an anchor in the High Republic. It kind of gets you excited. You know, it's like the younger Yoda. He's like not using a cane. He's got a Jedi. He's kind of a badass and people know him. The Nile know who he is. So he has a reputation in the galaxy. And I think that's kind of cool. So some some people don't like flippy flippy Yoda. I love Flippy Flippy Yoda. There's a lot of Flippy Flippy Yoda that happens along and so with I'm, Buckets of Blood. <laughs> I'm pro Flippy Flippy Yoda and Buckets of Blood. I think this is good. Like, I, I understand the the hesitancy because I'm also in that camp. But like, Avon Steros is the coolest. And so I am A-OK that her last name is Steros and that she has a character that's connected because Avon Steros is pretty one of my favorite characters that's been introduced thus far. She's awesome. I love a test of courage. Well, Sarah, speaking of one of our other favorite characters and our last bit of news here on, on the show yeah. before we go into our full spoiler discussion on Victory's Price, Geode. Geode. Finally got <laughs> artwork. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> he is he is human size. He is a human size rock. 
You know what? I expected him to be a little bit more um, like. Like Ten Commandments size? No, not Ten Commandments size, but like the Ten Commandments shape, you know, with like the curve mm. on the top of the tablet. Yeah. Um, but I know I fully knew that he was a human sized Vint rock from a uh, Vintian from Vint, like, you know, five and a half feet tall, two and a half feet wide rock. But I expected him to be a little bit more dome shaped at the top and less like a, a square. But I'll take it, you know, like I hadn't cannoned the dome, but we're getting the square. And like, that's not too much of a, a, a you know, a scene change in my mind. But to see geode in all of his party day glory i mean what a revelation oh what a great moment i had oh wow wow well, i mean wow. okay <laughs> well even though he is shaped like a square he is certainly not a square when it comes to the bar scene in the <laughs> no. galaxy because he is a wild man for those of you who don't know who we're talking about which you should geode is the character in claudia gray's into the dark so we've been waiting anxiously for the official artwork from Lucasfilm to see what this rock looks like. I've never wanted to study a rock in my entire life. And here I am. I'm like, I want to know all about this rock. You're I want like, to know about its composition. Tell me about its properties, how he's formed. Yeah. How, how much nitrogen is in, is in a vent? How much, <laughs> how much oxygen? How much carbon is in a vent? Are there, is there mm-hmm, even carbon mm-hmm. in rocks? I don't know because I was terrible at biology. Uh, yeah. See, do you remember the rock life cycle? <laughs> The rock life cycle. <laughs> Igneous really rock, sedimentary rock. You know, I actually the last rock is. studied environmental science uh, as my minor, so I should know a, Did a thing. Did you? Or, yeah, I should know a thing or two about rocks. Let's be wow. honest. Wow. Yeah. I love learning this about you. This is great. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, everybody should go eco-friendly. So just, you know, do the little things in your life that contribute to a better, healthier earth. Yeah, but also pressure corporations to do better because they suck. Yeah, they do suck, actually, though. Sarah, I, uh, that's, that's all the news I had. Did you have anything else that you wanted to mention before we kind of turn it over? No, I feel like we got through everything, and that felt, that felt good. That felt good. I feel yeah. good about this. I feel good about what we're about to talk about. The energy and the vibes are good. Through the roof. Well, before <laughs> we turn it over to the main topic of today's show, let me remind everybody, if you would be so kind to do so, please rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening because it helps other people to find the show. So if you have like a couple extra minutes in your day, just go hit the little five-star button and write a little blurb about Sarah or I or um, about how much you love Geode or how much you love Alphabet Squadron. Just let us know. Helps other people want to listen to Friends of the Force. So that would be a huge help. But Sarah, Mm -hmm. Victory's Price, an Alphabet Squadron novel written by Alexander Freed is what we're here to talk about today. It's the final book in the alphabet squadron trilogy which began in 2019 in the summer so this was a i was was so young then (laughs) this was a summer book and it was uh, i can't believe we finally made it yeah how does it feel (sighs) man yeah man i mean we're here we're here we made it and this wasn't a journey that i expected to go on i didn't know that i was gonna love these books and here i am better for having read them and that feels really good and i feel really justified in my enjoyment of them when i first heard about alphabet squadron i think this was back in december of 2018 i was like that is a really silly name for a star wars book. Mm-hmm. i was like this Definitely. is this is absurd not in like a hateful way just kind of like a eh, maybe not for me sort of way you know and i i always give star wars books a chance because i love reading and i love star wars so i'm gonna you know again i love star wars publishing as a as a unit and i think they do like probably the best things of of anything in the franchise uh, maybe outside of animation with that exception um but i was like okay i'll still give it a chance and i read it and it was just unlike anything i'd ever read before it was just so character focused it wasn't about the pew pew which you would think it would be because there's an x-wing on the cover it's tied into a Marvel comic book to start with called TIE Fighter. So you're obviously thinking like this is just kind of a pew pew dogfight book, which, yeah, there's elements of that in, in the book, but that's not its heart. And that's really that's really clear with the conclusion to this trilogy is that the heart of this trilogy is not pew pews. There's a lot of that, but the heart of this trilogy is uh, a story about how we move forward, how we move on after war yeah. you know that's kind of how you distill it down 
And that's beautiful because we, we kind of fill in the gaps that need to be filled in, but don't get talked about enough. Yeah. 2019, Sarah was like, mm, Alphabet Squadron, that seems like a silly name. Also, a book about squadrons. <laughs> I don't want to do the pew pew dog face. That's not for me. And then I read this book and I ate Alphabet Squadron up. I It was one of my favorite books. I saw I, I commuted two hours each way to my internship that summer. And you go, wow, Sarah, that's crazy. Yes, it was. Moving on. Um, I spent an hour on a train every day and I got to read. And I read that book in nine days um, there and back. I would, I would just like wait until the day was over so I could get on the train and like open up the book and keep going. And Oh, man, the rest the rest is history. Like I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And I'm so glad this book is so rooted in these heavy and difficult topics and feelings and concepts that we get to explore through these characters. And they all are relevant to today and teaching us something about ourselves perhaps and teaching us something about the world that we live in and how we can make our world better and I think that is just so valuable and I mean in the middle of all that too there is incredible action and fun villains and really interesting moments that you never would have suspected and also great um, genres of music that I haven't forgot about and the quantitative institute for quantitative studies at Bothawui I'll never forget it (laughs) Thank you, Alexander, for the higher institution of what was it? <laughs> um, the Institute for Quantitative Studies at Bathawui. <laughs> oh my God, that's Shadow- a flashback. It's from Shadowfall. <laughs> wow. Oh man, that is uh, that is something to, to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Wow. <laughs> I am not over it. <laughs> Never forget. Yeah. Truly. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just so excited to talk about this book, and we're not going to do a non-spoiler section. This is kind of as much of a non-spoiler section as you're going to get because. We figure by this point, if you're listening to the final book review, you've probably read the first two books and you're already bought into the series. However, if you haven't and you're still listening, I would actually urge you to not listen to the spoiler review and go experience the books for yourself because they are really something. And personally for me, I I won't get into specifics, but they have kind of given me everything and more that I really, really, really wanted out of the sequel trilogy. And that's uh, for many different reasons. It's a ton Mm -hmm. of different reasons. And uh, that is not a diss on the sequel trilogy at all. I love the sequel trilogy, not necessarily how it ended, but I think as like a a perfect unit of of three installments, like Alphabet Squadron does it really, really well. So we are going to talk about Victory's Price today. So here's how we're talking about the book in four parts. So in part one, we are talking about our overall impressions. Then in part two, we're talking about the characters and their relationships. In part three, we're going to talk about the title itself, Victory's Price. What does that mean and what is the true price of victory? And our fourth part is odds and ends, the little things that didn't really fit into everything else, but we still wanted to mention them because they're important. So Sarah, without further ado, let's talk about Victory's Price by Alexander Freed. <laughs> We've made it to the end of the road. Here we are. Here we are. Lots of tears. Folks, don't be surprised if we cry during this episode. Might yeah, happen. Um, <laughs> please forgive me in advance. Because every time I cried a lot while reading this book, Brad has the audios in our text conversation to prove that I was a hot ass mess after finishing this book. And I have cried when I tried to talk about this book. So we'll, we'll see if I can get through it without crying. It'd be a real achievement if I did. Yeah, it's perfect blackmail. Like, once I decide to cancel you, I'm going to leak those. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> Although I will admit, I also cried over this book. Yeah. Sarah, I thought, you know, last year for our Shadowfall episode, we did mm-hmm. a little catharsis, right? Yeah. Um, where we went to the corners of our room and stood in the corner and just kind of got some feelings out. Aired them out. Yeah. And to be clear, everybody, this is spoiler. This is spoiler territory from here on out. So if you haven't already read the book. I already said a spoiler like a minute ago. (laughs) Well, too late, everybody. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) So, Sarah, I thought we could do the same thing because I think we just need to like, I think we just need to like get it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if I need to like yell like I did last time, but I have some, I have some thoughts. Let's, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. We're going to start. All right. Mm -hmm. My headphones are off. Well, Lark is baby. I can't believe it ended well. 
Oh my god. <laughs> it ended well. Happy endings in Star Wars. It ended well. My Star Wars. They all lived. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Alexander freed me. More like Alexander like... freed me of my pain. I, it feels so good. It oh. feels so good. And I love it. Well, I'm back. Are you back, Sarah? I can't hear you yet. Oh, no. Now I can hear you. I have wired oh, headphones, you know. Yeah. You got to get the... Yeah. No. Do you want, do you want to fund that? Because no. <laughs> I need new headphones anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> These are falling apart. Um, but what did you talk about? The <laughs> fact that we get a happy ending where everybody lives, no matter what they've done in the past, because Star Wars has this really horrible pattern of, mm. you know, uh, redemption through death. And Mm -hmm. splitting up families and those families not necessarily getting back together, you know. And so here I was really worried going into the book that, you know, we have this really misfit group of people who've all done terrible things at one point in their life. Maybe with the exception of Will Lark. I think Will Lark's the only one who's really mostly sin free, quote unquote sin free, because he's he's always the one. never heard of fly. Yeah, he's always wanted to be the one that stops the war. You know, he doesn't want to take Mm -hmm. the life if he doesn't have to. But for the most part, I was like, okay, well, probably Chast is going to die. Like, Quill might die because she's done some bad things on the Cronus. And, you know, she's going to want to redeem herself through death. And I was just shocked beyond belief that all five of them made it out of this book alive. And I was, like, so happy because now I know when I go back and reread these books, I know what to expect. I know we're going to get the happy ending. I know it's a story that I can go back to as a comfort story and Mm -hmm. that won't bring up bad feelings or sad feelings. Even though it is an emotional book, it's not a sad book. I mean, it's it's bittersweet in a lot of ways. And I there was a point, and I'll tell you the point, when I sent you that audio when I started chapter twenty one, and I said, I don't know if I'm ready to do this. And I was crying. I started crying. It was it was very weird. But I was just like, I don't know if I'm ready to do this. I don't know if I'm ready to know, you know, that one of them dies or that something bad, like truly bad happens. And I, I, you know, if I'm going on this journey, I don't want it in a lot of ways. And I felt so relieved. And that's what I talked about when I was stepped away from the microphone, <laughs> that it ended well. And I, they all lived. They all got to live. It felt like that Doctor Who moment where um, he's like, just this once, everybody lives. And you're just like, oh my God, thank Jesus. And um, Is that Matt Smith, Matt Smith season? Um, Christopher Eccleston mm. is the first one that does it from the um, Are You My Mummy episode, if oh, you recall yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do love um, that one. I went and I, I watched the whole clip back. <laughs> um, um, you were on but, cloud nine, but with this with this book, <laughs> I literally like I like sent you I sent you my crying messages and then I was like laying in bed watching this clip on my phone. But, you know, like I wasn't ready to go on the journey if one of them died. And especially in this past year where I. I don't want to be more sad. And yeah. that doesn't mean that I don't read some sad things or engage in some sad entertainment i have but i don't want to be sad Mm -hmm. you know unless i know that i'm about to watch a drama film that's where i know the character dies or or that has a sort of predetermined end or a predictable end i want to feel happy (laughs) i want to feel fulfilled i want to feel like i did not waste this time and i want to feel justified in my enjoyment of the, the, the thing, whatever the thing may be. And I feel like this conclusion hit all of those points. It made me feel happy. It made me feel satisfied. It made me feel justified for my enjoyment of the thing. And that's that's huge because I, um, and again, I hate to bring up the sequel trilogy, but like I didn't get that with the sequel trilogy. And I have been searching for that within Star Wars. You know, I have felt a little Star Wars homeless for a bit. And now the High Republic is happening and it's, destined to end in tragedy and i just i just pretend it's not the tr- pretend it's not the way that it's gonna go but i kind of feel like that's obviously where some of those characters are gonna go um and having a conclusion here where we know what's happening five years down the line and there's some peace in all of it is a true comfort and it makes me feel hope for our current situation, even though obviously this is a space fiction and our situation is way different. But 
um, I think in the past year, I've had a lot of trouble envisioning my own future. And the very end reminded me that um, there is a future out there. So, yeah, you know, yeah. that's that's the thing, right? Because if you look at a character like Chas, who is so worried about her future after the war and like that's almost driving too many of her actions during the war to say, you know, I don't I, I this is the future I project for myself. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to go out in a blaze of glory. But then she kind of has this will to live. And, and you know, even though parts of her, that future come true, she ends up still making a choice to have a different future. So it's like, no matter what path you have ahead of yourself, there's always a different path that you can take. And I think, yeah, like you said, now that we're living in a pandemic, this book kind of comes right at the perfect time for us because, you know, not every story is going to be a happy ending. That is, that is an unrealistic standard for stories. Sometimes you need those sort of grim, dark stories that have a tragic ending and say something about the world that's a little more gut-wrenching and 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 it really hits you in the feels but like yeah like you said justifying your investment in three books i mean we've been with these characters for almost a thousand pages you mm-hmm. don't want to read something or watch something and in that final hour feel like it all crumbles around you just to hit these sort of like weird narrative beats that a lot of storytellers keep falling into, right? It's like, oh, let's let's shoehorn everything we can into at the final hour to make it, you know, this like fun nostalgia trip. Let's let's kind of let's just kind of take the easy route out, you know. Let's just kill Yurika Quell because that's going to be the easiest thing to explore. You know, she died doing the great thing, and that was that. No, this book deals with questions of how do we treat people who've done really bad things? What kind of life can they live? And that ends up being the central thesis statement of the alphabet squadron trilogy is like what do we do with the sinners what do we do with the people who have screwed up who fought for the empire who just did some bad stuff and 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 don't want to live in fear the rest of their lives but also understand that they did some bad shit need to need to pay for it you know and i i think of i was thinking of hamilton the the song wait for it because oh, yeah. I, I thought uh, it's, it says here, I know it says love doesn't discriminate, but I'm thinking of like life. So like life doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes and it takes. And we keep living anyway. We laugh and we cry and we break and we make our mistakes. And if there's a reason I'm by her side or anybody's side, when so many have tried that I'm willing to wait for it. So it's like this idea that... Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we qua- cry. Yes, we break. Yes, we laugh together as Alphabet Squadron. But in the end, there's a reason we're going to be by each other's sides and we're willing to wait for it, even if it might be hard to deal with or it might be hard to, you know, like kind of face those truths. But it's it's it, it like and like, again, life is, doesn't discriminate. Like we all make mistakes. So it's just like, how are you going to lead a better future? And that's what this book answers. That's what this trilogy answers. It does good things, Sarah. Narratively, make Alexander Freed write everything. I love him so much. Anyways. I am over here having a proud friend moment. Brad is bringing up Hamilton on the pod. Yes, I did. And Lin-Manuel Miranda is in The Rise of Skywalker. It all makes sense. It's all connected. <laughs> no, but I am I am loving this because the song Wait For It um, within the context of Hamilton is so fascinating because it's it's um it's Burr choosing not to take action. But in in the way that you're describing it, you kinda miss there's a there's a, a verse where instead of love doesn't discriminate, it's death doesn't death discriminate. Death doesn't discriminate, yeah. So so you are hitting it right there. Um and if there's a reason I'm still alive when everyone yep. who loves me has died. We rise and we fall and we break. Yeah, yeah. I mean I mean and it's it's talking about living through the trauma. And you talked about, you know, what do we do with the sinners? But I think the other half of it, other than Eureka, is how do we move forward with this trauma? How do we live with trauma, no matter what it may be? How do we move past our own understanding of what our life is to redefine ourselves and our expectations for ourselves because you know chas ex- wanted to die or expected to die in a blaze of glory and she had she got to live she had the, the you know the privilege of being able to live after the war but you know 
what does that mean for her? You see her vision in Shadowfall, and for a, a while there, it seems to have come true before she goes back to Eureka. And, I, you know, how does Will deal with this trauma? He goes home, he doesn't fly, but he finds himself useful in other ways. How does Nath deal with this trauma? Well, Nath, uh, does he really deal with this trauma? I don't know. He just kind of keeps going. Well, in a way, he, he goes back into his pirate ways. You know, that's what's yeah. comfortable for him. That's the way he wants to define himself. Even if it might not be the best choice for him, as Will recognizes, it's what he ends up doing because that's what he finds comfort in. And then Kairos is off on her own journey. She's doing exactly what she needs to do because she, perhaps more than any of them, perhaps, literally is dealing with the shame of her own person and um, changing into somebody new. And, uh, oh! this book <laughs> you know i don't i don't mean to keep going about hamilton but one last line i will throw in there I which will, is brad after... i did a whole high school graduation <laughs> speech and i used hamilton quotes like that that was the commencement speech i gave oh, i listened to so the song a bunch of times after I, I finished reading but the the line is i am the one thing in life i can control so mm -hmm. you know when we think about all these stories and the idea of like hiding our shame do we hide our shame or do we face it that's kind of the mm -hmm. idea of victory's price. That is the price of victory. It is like, listen, the things you do in war, the things you do when the galaxy is divided, you can't just forget those things. And if you do, then you fall into this repeated pattern. And that's why this whole idea of like, you know, what does the Republic do? How does the Empire, everybody who served the Empire, do they have to hide what they did? No, because if they did, mm -hmm. nobody remembers what they did. Nobody remembers how we got to that point, how the Empire rose. How did Palpatine get his power? Right. So it's addressing this idea of like, what is a new republic? What mm -hmm. does a new republic look like? But it's within the context of these, like the small band of characters. It's almost like a small case study. And interestingly enough, Yerk Quill becomes literally like, you know, kind of like, quote unquote, a uh, criminal zero in a way. Right. Like she's the first mm -hmm. one that makes that makes the example out of everybody else almost, you know. And that's kind of their baseline is Yurika Quill. That's why this important is that's why this story is important. She is she is like the first. She's patient zero. It's crazy. Yeah, they really use her to figure out who they're gonna be in some ways, the new republic. And that's really fascinating. But it's also about all the other characters who are trying to live in this new world and trying to figure out who they are and based on what they do to quell or what they don't do to quell who are they you know who are who is the new republic and who is quell depending on what happens to her all very interesting questions posed here at the, the very end of this book and i'm just so glad we got the conclusion of all of their stories in the way that we did i think that freed really wrapped it up and brought it home in just the most eloquent and exciting and meaningful ways that he possibly could have and you know we were talking about how alphabet squadron was a summer book and shadowfall was a summer book and how this is a winter book and i think it, i think we we're right when you said it's exactly where it needed to be um coming up on a year of panoramic platonic <laughs> potomac river coming up on a year of it polaroids polaroids <laughs> um, doesn't really do it uh, no it doesn't but it's funny i tried um yeah some of these messages that it's sharing with us through these characters feel relevant to right now and this anniversary that we're unfortunately upon and um yeah i i don't think i can properly express how grateful i am for this story and this conclusion well when you think about will lark who the entire book he wants to go home there's one line that really stuck out to me when he's talking to Nath and you can kind of see the tiredness in Will Lark during this book. It's, it's like he's so focused on wanting to get to the end of that mission so he can go home, but almost to the point of exhaustion. He is, he can't enjoy himself, but he says it's all been close to ending for a year now. And like, when you think about that in the context of the pandemic, right, it's, it's always felt like, you know, the pandemic is, it's kind of close to ending, but it's really never been close to ending. It's always been this constant Ugh. uphill yeah. climb and People who say it's ending, it's it's not. We've always had, you know, wave after wave, and you know, now we're waiting for the vaccine. So it it, it is, like you said, the perfect timing. And I just want to know, like, 
you know, Alexander Freed, I, I want to talk about him for a little bit before we yeah. start to get into more of the the character relationships in this book. But, you know, we've talked a lot about him as an author and how he is sort of a, a gold standard amongst, you know, the Claudia Grays of, of Star Wars publishing and and the, you know, the Justinas and, and the and the Rebecca Roan horses like he is so good. He writes authentic characters that you remember that are often overlooked i think you know even a book like twilight mm-hmm. company it has the words battlefront on it but really you take those words off and that book is just as character driven as as alphabet squadron if not you know yeah. as good so he I don't, I don't know what he does he focuses less on the pew pew and more on the the conversations the intimacy between everybody and like even the first maybe what 150 pages of this book are pretty slow to begin with because a lot of it is sort of a chase, a game of cat and mouse Mm -hmm. between the Republic and shadowing slash the empire. You know, they're all having these meetings, trying to find each other and end the battle once and for all. But even during that first 150 pages, it's very character driven. Like every conversation Mm -hmm. matters. Every conversation has something important and something to say and something that kind of culminates towards the end of the book. Yeah, absolutely. And it feels like all of that part of the book, that first section and a little bit in the second section is is allowing us to understand what happened after Cerberon and how these characters are moving forward or not moving forward, especially considering nobody has a full understanding of what anybody else is going through and nobody has a full understanding of what Quell's intentions were in leaving you know they think she's dead they think she's with the 204th and has defected back into shadow wing uh they think that they're the only one dealing with it in the way that they are and they've lost karen in ito their mentor and leaders they've lost all of their leadership between <laughs> karen ito and quell and seeing will kind of take on this role as the leader of the the wing i guess of you know hail riot whatever whatever squadrons are around yeah. alphabet flare um, squadron flare yeah. yeah uh and and seeing that all kind of come together and then how they how the characters all come together after that time and they're apart and they start to actually talk to each other and understand one another and seeing the growth that they go through <sighs> incredible stuff I truly don't think there's anybody writing character like Alexander Freed does it. And I'm, and I'm not saying just in Star Wars. Like, I don't think I have ever read a book quite like I have read this series and understanding these characters um, and writing these characters so that we, we know who they are made of or like what they're made of and who they are both inside and outside. And it is so fascinating to me to really understand them in that way because Claudia writes incredible characters. Her characters from Into the Dark are amazing. I mean, you can just listen to me talk in that review. I love them. I love them. I am a Comac Vetus girl through and through. <laughs> um, but these characters, I know a lot about them. I know what makes them tick. I know why they're doing what they're doing. I know their trauma. I know their pain. I know their suffering. I know their goal. I know how they feel about themselves. I know how they feel about other people. Like, I feel like I know every facet of them. And that is incredible. It is so incredible. And I, I feel like they're all a part of me now that I've, you know, that I've read these, their stories over three books and they all feel like a part of me. And that is so special and so excellent and i think part of the reason why we can get characters like this in the way that we've gotten them is i don't know if the, how 100 percent true this is if it is 100 percent true but i recall at star wars celebration 2019 me little sarah at a <laughs> lucasfilm panel going listening to these authors talk about their process and alexander freed saying that he does not improvise anything that he has a full outline and he writes front to back he gets through the whole thing and he doesn't really add any scenes that he didn't plan to add in his outline and i think that really allows him now we can ask him you know like if that is still how he writes and if if what he talked about then is 
authentic to what his process really looks like. Um, but I, what I think that does is allows him to understand each step of the story and the process and allows him to understand where things are shifting for the characters in a really detailed way mm -hmm. that gives him the ability to show us, the reader, all of those details as well. Because he has such an understanding of where he's starting, where he's ending, and how he's getting from A to Z. It's not like, here's A, here's where we are, here's Z, here's where I want them to go. And we're just gonna, we're gonna go for it. It's like, you know, you're playing, you're playing shoots and ladders and you have it mapped one to a hundred. Yeah. He's <laughs> more of a, of a show author than a tell author. You know, he's not just like, you know, here's, Hey, we're at point C now. We were just at point A. It's like, no, here's point A. Here's point mm -hmm, A.5. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, here's A.6. So like, he, see, that's the thing. We get to see yeah. the point one, point two, point three, point four, point five before we get to He's number one <laughs> so articulate so detailed like the smallest details down to hearing about how a character is trembling or the quiver in their voice like little tiny things like that that say so much without saying so little and he makes mm. every every word on the page count like i found myself just highlighting everything in the book and like when we talk today with some quotes from him we're not gonna we're not gonna paraphrase we're gonna read the quote straight from it because the writing is too good to do it any justice by paraphrasing or by way of paraphrase. So like you can't because all the detail the, the 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 devils are in the details because you know, we can we can paraphrase some quotes about the force and you know get the gist of it. But I, it's it's ooh, it's all the pieces together are what make the <laughs> make the puzzle work. And uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, incredible. Ugh, oh, love it. I mean, just Genius. listen to the just listen to this on page 17. Quote, hyperspace roiled around the A-wing's interceptor, cosmic energies licking its viewport like sea foam. Will Lark felt the vessel's engines pulse in time with his breath, his worn seat creak and flex with his every motion. Once, he had found lightspeed travel wondrous and terrifying. Now it was almost meditative, a tranquil moment before a thunderclap. Love it. Like, sea foam, describing it kind of washing up against your A-wing. Like, you feel the kind of rhythmic, calming sense of the ocean kind of hitting, hitting the sand, that sort of sloshing sound that you get when it's dark out on the beach. And it's just so quiet. Mm -hmm. You just hear the rhythm of the ocean. Like, that's what you get when you read that line. It's so freaking good. Like, how, like that's just I'm talking about hyperspace. Mm -hmm. Page 337. Harris and Dula <laughs> stood in the center of an expanding fleet like a newborn universe. Like, come on. The stuff is too good. <laughs> come on. Come on, <laughs> we're, we're really good at this. We're really good at this. Come on. <laughs> Sarah, what did you have? Um, well, I have what I found to be the and you said it before i finished the book and i think that's why i highlighted this particular phrase or this particular um yeah this particular quote they were united by their goals they were united by their motives and you really said that this is a book about motives and a book about intention and it is it's a book about why are, are we doing the things that we're doing and when do we hit our limits and who are we when we go past our limits or who are we when we stick to our guns and our morals and that moment that that quote kind of happens um when they've all come kind of come back together i believe but they're not quite accepting of one another so they're kind of just i don't want to say going through the motions but they're they're moving through it because they know that they all kind of have a united front even if they don't trust each other again yet um but they are united by their motives. Their motives are what band everybody together on on the rebellion's side. So, I, it's just little. It's little things. It's little things. And I will say that, like, I didn't highlight just simple sentences or anything like that throughout this book. Like I, I did in Shadowfall. Like Shadowfall, I was all over the details. Just little things that popped up, I would, I would highlight them. This one, I really focused on the conversations that were happening between the characters and what it meant for them. And I just felt like this book really excelled at that. And this little phrase that I, I brought up here is just a little piece of, of, of book that tells us a lot about where they are as characters and who they are. Mm-hmm. Alexander Freed recently, before the book came out, he did a uh, article or a column with an excerpt from the book on Polygon. And I thought this was 
you know, to close us out this, this part one of our conversation, I think this really hits, uh, hits home why this trilogy works, why Freed's process works, why we love these books so much. So mm-hmm. he says, the most obvious questions, who's going to win the war and how? How did the First Order start? What happened to Luke, Leia, and Han had been answered. No, I said the most obvious questions and not the most important questions. For me, the Alphabet Squadron trilogy was an opportunity to dig beneath the surface, to fill in the gaps and ask, if that's what happened, what does it mean? What does it imply about the galaxy, what it dealt with, and what's to come? This book, even though it does answer some of those obvious questions, it answers more of the most important questions. So it's like, you know, if, if the war happened, what does it mean? What does it imply about how the galaxy is going to recover from the war and what's to come and how the New Republic is going to deal with now that they are the leading political party in this galaxy? What do they do with that power? They're in their infancy. How do they build from that? And what is their set of beliefs that they build around? You know, like from, from books mm-hmm. like Bloodline and from Chuck Wendig's trilogy, we know the New Republic is already established and they're doing their thing. And that's kind of what you're told and you're thrown into it. And that's great. I love those books so much. Mm-hmm. But like, this is really like, what is the building blocks? What, are the, what is the DNA of the New Republic? What is the philosophy that's going to guide every single decision they make? And it starts with Alphabet Squadron. It starts with Yerka Quill. It starts with Harris and Dula talking to Mon Mothma about what do we do with Quill? What do we show the Republic? This is going to be public information now that it's out. Yeah. You know, now that everybody knows there's this thing uh, you know, Soren Keys broadcasted about himself to the galaxy. Now mm-hmm. they know all eyes are on us. You know, we it, it might have been a lot easier to do this in private and and make her you know make her punishment come down pretty harshly. But it's like uh, or let her get away with it maybe. But like now that the eyes are on us, like what are we gonna do to lead by example? And that's what this book answers, and that's why it's like so great because you have to have all those small character moments to build up to that decision to say like this is why we have to do this this way. That's, this is why it has to work for this Republic to succeed. Yeah. And I'm an absolute sucker for a book about feelings. Me too. Especially within, <laughs> especially within Star Wars. Because in the movies, we are getting a battle between good and evil. And we don't have a lot of time to dwell on Baru and, uh, you know, Uncle Owen burning. You know, we don't have a lot of time to for Luke to process that trauma. He has to kind of go forward. We don't have a lot of time (laughs) anywhere, I guess, for Leia to really process or talk about or feel the emotions that she's been dealing with as a princess and as a senator and as a general. And that's why I love Rose's inclusion in TLJ because the first moment that we see her, she is crying. She is grieving. She is having this emotional reaction, this logical emotional reaction to what has just happened to her and her world by losing her closest loved one. And the fact that the Alphabet Squadron trilogy essentially gives me three books of feelings with a little bit of action in between is the best thing ever. The question of what does it all mean is, oh, it's. It's the exactly the right question to be asking, because if I may borrow a, a Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility, but how are we dealing with that power and responsibility when things go wrong or when we have to make a difficult decision? And that's why I think something like, again, WandaVision, if we're talking about other Things that are dealing with those sorts of big emotions. It's a story of of grief, truly. And those stories that really focus in on the emotions are so important and cathartic and valuable in this time when, again, as I talked about earlier, there's just so much going on in the world. And I think stories that deal with emotions allow us to process our own experiences and emotions. And I'm so glad that we got not one, but three books within the Star Wars world that dig deep into the feelings of it all. Couldn't have said it better, honestly. I, I do think this trilogy is kind of a dark horse. It's the Trojan horse of Star Wars books, right? Like, because you look at it and you're like, that's, that's not for me. 
that's has X Wing on the cover. I don't I don't that's want a book about name. pilots, you know? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, a silly no. name. But if you've learned anything from this conversation, it's have we been talking about spaceships, Sarah? Have we been talking about the T seventy that Quill flies in the Coruscant? No. I will say. But it's great. It's so great. That though. reveal was poof, awesome. <laughs> that was cool, yeah. That was so cool. Sequel trilogy X Wing, you know. There are a couple ship moments in this in this book that are very exciting, which we will get to. Yes, but, but what what led our conversation I was I the feelings. I don't care about the ships, you know. Yeah. Like, oh my god. The, Although the, there's the one ship, the one ship though. Oh, I, you, we are in agreement Ch- about that. Chas That's what and I was Quill. About. Like, like, what is the ship name for that? By the way. <laughs> uh, wow. We do we have oh, Chasica? Chasica? Chat. No, that doesn't work because it's like Chas Jessica. <laughs> wow, we're really we stumped know. here. We're gonna come back um, to this. We're gonna revisit this. We're gonna probably like come up uh, with something in the in the moment uh, later on. But Sarah, to keep things moving forward in an orderly fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any, oh, anyway, I, TLDR Alexander Freed <laughs> rocks. Thank you. He's great. You know, we have a funny photo in here of of Bugs Bunny from the movie mm-hmm. Space Jam, where he's holding up the the bottle that says Michael's secret stuff. And I would like to think that Alexander Freed has a similar bottle of something at his house called Alexander's Secret Stuff. And it's it's the thing that he wakes up with every morning and has a nice cup of, you know, it's like instead of the morning Joe, Alexander Freed's waking up and having whatever he's having now and writing brilliant stories. Like, I, I want what he's having. I want that coffee or whatever he's drinking. Like, if it's a matcha tea, I don't know. I need to know. Is it a, is it a, is it an espresso? Is it a chai tea latte? What is it, Alexander? Tell me. What's the secret yeah. sauce? How is it tell made? Us, you, <laughs> tell us your secret so that we can understand the human condition better. Because I, 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 don't, know how he, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he does it. How is he doing it? He's doing <laughs> it like I want no one to. else. <laughs> I want to. I want to know because it's so, it's so magical. And it's clear to me that he just understands what it means to be a person. And Absolutely. That's that rocks. You know that shit's great. I keep saying the Alexander Freed Publishing Universe. <laughs> mm-hmm. You got these three books. You got Twilight Company, and then you have the Rogue One novelization. Which, looking at everything of all Star Wars authors, that actually ties him with Claudia Gray as the most published Star Wars author currently in the current canon. Timothy Zahn, Timothy Zahn is just behind them. He's about to publish his fifth book as well, with greater good. So I think that's really awesome. I think you should all read his other books. And I, again, I'm just, you know, super thankful that we got this trilogy. It ended the way that we wanted it to. I think we've had quite a bit to say on this first part, uh, probably too much to say, but it, this book just gets us. I, I'm so giddy talking about this goddamn book. It's just, <laughs> it's just so good. I lose track. And it's, <laughs> we spent two hours yesterday coming up with an just, outline just and we kind of knew we kind of knew that we wouldn't even stick to the outline that we spent two hours on because you kind of you kind of have to talk about it all at the same time. There's no way to really separate these pieces as well as we would really like them to be for sake of episode formatting. Well, we are definitely trying our best. So given that, we are now going to turn it over to our part two, which is the focus on characters and relationships. I will say, I hop back into our Shadowfall notes, and I just want to shout out us. Um, if you want to insert the clip, you can do that. But if you don't, I'll just say what's in that's our notes. That's a lot of editing, Sarah. You're gonna have to, you have to tell. I the know. Peep, so the here's that's <laughs> that's why I'm here in the the word document. What's next? And then we said Coruscant. It's hinted at in a game of who, what, where. Uh, and then Vital says, where? Coruscant, obviously. We survived this mission. We're headed there sooner or later. And maybe while Vital didn't go there, um, Quell clearly did. We've seen the Battle of Jakku, but what about Coruscant? <laughs> we got <laughs> we, both. We learned. <laughs> um, We've been new. We, we, got, we, we got both. Uh, incredible. <laughs> and, and so the, the crazy thing that, that we ended up getting both at the same time, and you mentioned the line being open between the members of uh shadow f- or members of shadow i almost said the members of Shadowfall. who am i the members that doesn't you're, even make you're sense a fake the alphabet of, squadron fan i am <laughs> obviously me sitting in the fetal position on my floor crying makes me a <laughs> fake fan I, like lol she has emotions 
those are fake she's just <laughs> she's just trying to impress somebody you know like she's just trying to like be cool be cool so people will like her um no just kidding that was happening at 2 a.m nobody saw me um so uh i just think it's it's pretty amazing that we got all of it uh there's a lot going on there okay i don't know why i brought that up yet i felt like it i just wanted to, to prove how awesome we are yeah by pretty cool. predicting where we would go next we just really love this trilogy so uh, i guess my, my my larger point is if uh, star wars book club uh hosted by chris and baver if you ever need guests in the future for uh, the Alphabet Squadron episodes. Um, Sarah and I are available because we just really love these books and we know them inside. Oh we know God. them inside will... and out. So just, you know, putting the feelers out. You know, if it's just, uh, you know, Kristen Baver, if I you're happy to be listening. These books forever. So, uh, you know, just hey, uh, hey Kristen hey. Baver. <laughs> so just let us know. Just let us know uh, when you're available. Anyways, so Sarah, <laughs> we're gonna talk about the moments that mattered. Uh, there's a lot of moments on here, and they kind of might all feed into each other, one way or another. But you know, what really propelled the book forward, we thought, was the character conversations and uh the lessons that were learned within each one and even if there wasn't a lesson learned you know how did it speak to the the human condition and what did it say about like what it means to to grieve or to love or to hope or to sacrifice or to worry or to fear like all of the human emotions that you feel were kind of like wrapped up in this in this three book arc and that's 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 pretty incredible so one of the first I want to talk about is with involving Kairos and Harris and Dula. And uh, this is shortly after their ship is attacked by a bunch of buzz droids. And again, they're in a retrofitted Star Destroyer, which I think is like really cool, by the way, that they're, you know, kind of using the Star Destroyer. And um, for, you know, especially Hera, she often brings up how it feels very weird to be back in that setting, uh, considering mm-hmm. she was Thrawn's prisoner in Star Wars Rebels. But Kairos is a character who really goes through the ringer in this book. Because she has sort of, she's lost her chrysalis, which is sort of uh, what she has seen as a cocoon. Uh, she was, you know, when she was a prisoner of the Empire way back when they experimented on her, they took her away from her planet because she was actually supposed to be somebody who was a liaison between her people and the Empire to figure out why are you here? What can we do? To, and, and, you know, we just want to serve because we don't want to be hurt. They took her. They experimented her. She became quote unquote unpure. And that is like really, really tragic. Honestly, it's a, it's a story about somebody who is haunted by trauma. And this uh, chrysalis is sort of a, a cocoon to help her become whole again, to kind of merge her body and spirit once more, because right now those things are broken. So, you know, now that she's had that chrysalis taken off of her in shadow fall she wears uh she wears kind of these wraps around her in this book to kind of cover up as much as her of herself as she can and Hera finds her in the hallway and she's bleeding and uh hair is there to wrap her wounds but kairos doesn't want her to touch her so they have this whole system that they get down where you know kairos can maneuver around Hera, and Hera never technically touches her but is able to wrap her wounds and kairos says blood is precious blood is self healing is, re- is rejuvenation not restoration healing is rejuvenation is change and there's this like whole thing where where Hera says uh you know you know i'll do what you need me to do it's fine and, and Kyra says you understand and Hera says i don't honestly but i don't need to in order to respect who you are and that is like just a good lesson in life is uh, mm-hmm. especially nowadays you know when people uh, are becoming more conscious of the things that they say and especially like a lot of the microaggressions that they have and it's like you don't necessarily need to understand what people go through but you just need to 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 respect people and you need to just like you know uh be conscious of, of how you act towards other people and i think that's what this like really boiled down to was hair was like listen i don't understand you completely or what you've gone through in life or how you're or, or like your culture like i don't understand all of it fully mm-hmm. but i'll respect it as much as i can by your wishes yeah, and that's just like such a beautiful because, poignant moment yeah because ultimately Hera sees Kairos's humanity I mean this is a space fiction there she's not a human but you get what I'm saying Kairos or, or Hera sees that this truly matters to Kairos and she doesn't want to disrespect Kairos more than she understands that Kairos has felt that she has been disrespected or violated or or altered in some way. And Hera saying that is is powerful because it really shows you who Hera is and who Hera has always been. 
but also is is wonderfully modeling just how to be somebody in the world. You know, we are not going to understand the life experience of every person we come across, big or small. But in, all we have to do is see the humanity of that other person and respect that that is who they are. And that is what they do. And if somebody dresses a different way or if somebody has a different um, religion or culture or background or language, all you have to do is understand that they are a person just like you. Yep. And and give them the space that you would want for yourself uh, and give them the respect that you would want for yourself. And that line is just so... It's so good. Obvious, but so special in this context. But do you want to keep talking about Kairos now that we're kind of on the topic of her? I know we would jump around a bit sort of in the timeline. I don't know what your your thoughts are on that. Um, on Kairos, I feel like one of the most key moments in Kairos' story is... The Kairos has not always been the Kairos as we know her. And we really get to see that in this book. And I'm so glad that um, Freed really allowed us to understand more of Kairos' story. And I want to jump to about 60% of the way through the book. I don't have the page number on my iPad. But it's kind of when they are going through her transformation and they are laying her her wrappings and her helmet, which she kept to the, I don't want to say gravesite, but offering to the memorial for the chrysalises of the people of her planet. She said she had not always been named Kairos when she was young, when she'd been young, nor had she become an em- the emissary of her people, for she had taken a second name then, as was custom. She had not been named Kairos in the camp when they made her less than she was, when they'd ripped away her skin to see what was underneath, when she'd seen the terrors, when she'd seen terrors to scar her soul, when those same terrors had attached themselves to every memory she possessed, so that she could not remember her people, the jungle, the beauty of her niece, without the taint of nightmares. She had named herself Kairos only after being given life by Aiden, who she'd acted who had acted with purity of intent but given her no choice in the matter. Kairos was the name of the creature who cocooned herself and sought to heal. Kairos was the name of the creature who bound, creature bound by blood and spirit and and horror to Adam, uh, Edo, and waged war against emperor and empire while her soul mended, who fought the shadow that Aiden saw, the shadow consuming worlds, and did so in in, in anger and in righteous fury. She had accepted her fate after Cerberon, but not had been, not been permitted to pass on. And it just keeps going about who she is. And this section is so beautiful because it allows us to understand what this trauma and what being a part of the war meant to Kairos and how disconnected she felt from everybody and everything and how her people, we learn, don't really make imprints in the ground, have this purity and metamorphosis, how they act in a way that is guiding themselves to to their home planet and connecting them with the, the wildlife and the world. And it feels really beautiful and, and bittersweet in her story that she ultimately does change and and get past the I don't know what I am I think she's working on finding it at the end of the book and I just think this passage here about who she is and who she was and who she is after her trauma is is really special so I know I read a lot of that but I felt that it was important to just say it all yeah I mean I think when we went to her home planet that was really unexpected Mm -hmm. I I love the whole scene too (laughs) too when they're flying in the U-wing and and she just goes like i know and they're like what do you know and she's like i know and they're and chas is like what do you yeah. know and she's like i know and then she punches it to like a hyperspace and they're just like where are we going so yeah you know, i thought that was kind of a, a funny comedic moment and she has a lot of those in this book where you know she's just uh she's so funny she's so stoic but she's stoic for a reason right i mean she carries a lot with her and mm-hmm. you don't necessarily see that until the 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 chrysalis is is uh, the chrysalis is actually off her body and you start to see who she truly is and even then you don't see who she truly is it's not until the very end of the book when she finally takes all of her wrappings off and she won't even let quill look at her 
but I just found it really fascinating how her culture kind of valued this idea of like purity. And if you lose your purity, you're no longer, uh, you're no longer accepted in that society. And for Kairos, that's like a, a lot to deal with. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know if this is necessarily like a one-to-one comparison, but I thought of like the Scarlet Letter and just, it kind of felt, uh, and even Chas referred to it as a cloak of shame. So it almost felt like Kairos had the Scarlet Letter that was on her. Um, by virtue of her uh, blood sort of being poison- poisoned by violence and destruction, you know, because the Empire touched her blood. It made her unpure. And, uh, you know, even though Aiden wanted to save her out of love, it wasn't her choice to be saved. She didn't want to be saved. So it was kind of done against her will in a way. So she kind of had that choice stripped away from her against her wishes, which, you know, even though Aiden uh, was doing it out of love, uh, he wasn't doing it out of the love for her people just for himself so it was a bit of a selfish move on his part i just i just you know really thought that was interesting and it says here this is all on page 264 too it says here she had awoken no longer truly kairos no longer anything remade in body and incomplete in essence whole in flesh but wrong in spirit body and spirit were no longer aligned her metamorphosis had been aborted and her incomplete self would need to pursue its journey with the soul crippled form it possessed So it's just like, this is how she felt pretty much after Cerberon. She, she no longer, uh, you know, she was on her way to healing and now she feel like that healing process is, is incomplete. And, you know, she's bleeding out with Hera and now there's more blood that's being lost. Her healing is set back even further. It's just like, it's painful to watch her go through this and how she feels like, you know, she can't remake her cocoon because it's, it's already been too long. It's, it's too late for her. So like, what does she do except sort of lash out and and be violent and and kind of just keep doing the kairos thing you know whereas by the end when she feels so tied to quell and she forgives quell and deems her worthy there's this moment where she thinks to herself how strange it was to seek so little blood how unlike kairos she had been you know so it's like you do see her changing you start to see her changing by the end of the book she realizes she doesn't have to be uh destructive she doesn't have to be violent because those things have already touched her spirit. She can change her ways, you know? And uh, when, when uh, Quill asks her where she's going, the first thing that she wants to touch from her skin is something that's not linked to pain or destruction. She wants to find a place that she doesn't need a shell, where her, blood and, her spirit and blood can resonate with air and life around her. She wants to go somewhere beautiful. I will find it. Be very well, my sister. And this is kind of the end of Kairos' journey. So it's just like so beautiful what she goes through in this book of like just feeling so unworthy and so tainted and so unpure. And like, by the end of it, she kind of redefines like, what does that mean? Like, can I still heal without this, this, this shell that I had before? Um, Is it the shell that makes me heal or is it my soul and my belief that makes me heal? And I think by the end of it, it's her belief in Quell that kind of guides her towards that point. And uh, you know, just the fact that they are sisters, which is just so beautiful. Yeah, and I want to go back a little bit. You said that she kind of transforms when she chooses to to leave and go find something new, but I I think she transforms when she chooses to forgive. Yeah. When she forgives Quell, which is such a powerful moment, because you know from the earlier books, specifically I think Shadowfall, we see that Kairos keeps all the dog tags from everybody she's killed in her ship. She keeps her helmet in her ship after uh, her plates are taken off of her, she really, that is her home. That is her comfort space. And when she forgives Quell and sacrifices that space, after Quell has said, you know, this could be another chrysalis for you. This could be another space where you grow and change. It frees her from the the bonds of, containment in some ways and allows her to really find herself and even though she still feels and I I think physically is um at the point when she leaves naked you know she is not covered and not what she wants to be yet she has allowed herself to go find that again and you were talking earlier about Quell not knowing who she is and after her trauma not feeling like she's anything and feeling like she she's clearly has a body, she can move her limbs, you know, she can speak, but doesn't feel like feels completely broken in spirit and feels she doesn't have a spirit. And 
again with this book coming out at just the right time, as we hit the year anniversary of um of Potomac River in our lives, <laughs> um, there was a lot of time I spent after everything changed because my life changed so dramatically where I said, I, I don't really feel like I know who I am. I don't know what defines me anymore. I feel like I've been yanked from a, a big chunk of my life without being able to say goodbye to the relationships in that space and not being able to to move forward in the next step of my life and not really knowing who I am and doing what I could to cope with that, which would, was back to the things that I knew. For Kairos, it's you know, hiding and hunting and killing. And for me, it was doing jigsaw puzzles. Um, only jigsaw puzzles. I went through my entire collection of over 40 jigsaw puzzles um, in a few months last year. Um, I, spent a, I spent a good amount of time, you know, not knowing who I was. And I mean, I'm still working on that. Mm -hmm. But I think Kairos' story allows me to think about the fact that I don't need as much as the the conclusion on one chapter of my life would have been really nice in the way that I expected it to happen. I don't need it in order to move forward. I can find a new way to move forward and a new way to define myself and be myself and seek a different and perhaps a more exciting future for myself. And so I think Kairos' story and by talking about her personhood in the way that in the way that um, Freed allows us to learn about her, I think is is really special and and really meaningful, and I am very grateful for it. Perfectly said. I think that's a, a great way to phrase it. And even relating it to your own life, I think uh, Kairos is is all of us who've who've been touched by you know horrible things in our life, and it's uh, those things don't have to define us. There's always a new way forward. You know, we'll we'll have to heal from those things, but we can always heal, you know, and uh, even if it's an unconventional way of doing so or a new way of doing so, uh, it's the perseverance and the belief that it, there is always a, a way to move forward. Like you said, it's uh, that's that what that's what sticks with me with her. Yeah. And if I can jump to a different kind of conversation or just moment that yeah. stuck out to me when Quell is taken by Kairos and Jess and made to come back. <laughs> Quell is looking at Kairos and Chas and kind of assessing them, watching them. Uh, Quell shrugged and looked from the Thelan to Kairos, who stood in the cockpit do doorway. Her body faced the cabin, but her head craned to peer out the cockpit viewport. This is when she's looking towards her planet. It was an awkward pose, unlike anything Quell normally associated with the woman. She'd always lurked like a statue in the shadow, immobile and foreboding. Now she seemed distracted by the stars. Chaddock, too, seemed different, not just physically, though the rest of her... Although the crest of her hair was centimeters shorter and flatter than Quell remembered, as if she'd sliced it with a hand place. But... Where she'd always been volatile, she now seemed to oscillate between furious and withdrawn with nothing in between. She was less than the person Quell remembered. And like that really resonated with me too in this time in the past year, that I felt less than the person that I knew that I was for a while. And it's the weight of trauma and the weight of grief. And for, for Chas, who's constantly performing this... Um, cult role that she is comfortable with because she grew up in a cult but doesn't actually believe in it's just like what she has instead of her music these days she's dealing with the trauma of being back in a cult dealing with the grief of being ripped away from that space again losing her music and attempting to be this cultist but but quell notices that she's not all who she remembered she She's oscillating between furious and withdrawn. She's either at 100 or at zero. And she can't do 50. And I feel that too. I, I, I understand that feeling. And I appreciated the way that Quell got the time away from her, her friends and her family in Alphabet Squadron. And was able to come back and look at them with a fresh set of eyes and understand the ways in which, or, or be, start, begin to understand the ways in which the Cerberon battle affected them just as much as it affected Quell. And I think Quell recognizes something in herself that she is a bit broken too, 
and for a while she doesn't talk I, I kairos asks her what what became of karen and ito and she says they died and she says i tried to save them but i couldn't and doesn't elaborate on what happened because it hurts her uh, because ultimately she cared about them and because th- what happened to her on that wasteland before you know chapter 18 chapter 18 um before she is able to leave is horrifying and sad and not how she wanted to remember those characters and and so her recognizing how others are dealing with the different events that they went through through the same major event is i think really valuable because we all deal with major tragedies differently and internalize those things and respond to them in different ways well when we think about chas too you know why does she seem less of a person like what's going through her mind in this point in time like why is she turning to the children of the empty sun and to letitia's sermons that she has on her new cassette tapes you know and alex alexander freed when he was in this polygon article he talked kind of through each character and what and he you know he specifically says he wanted to explore trauma during a time of crisis and what it means to carry that trauma afterward so he says for for chas and this also applies to nath he says as well they're both studies in what people drawn to the rebellion for the wrong reasons might face and what it means to go from being the underdog to an enforcer of the status quo. So when you think about Chas and like what her history is, right? She was with, uh, she was, you know, a Hound 3 as part of the Caverns Angels and Hound Squadron. That was an alphabet squadron when they're flying through the orbital cluster and they're being chased by shadowing and everybody's getting p- picked off. I always remember Satanik for some reason. That's the name I always I always remember for that old squadron. Uh, rest in peace, Satanik. R.I.P. 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 So there's a point, you know, when this is another kind of moment that happens on page 123, and it's when, you know, I think at one point, uh, Chas is in her cockpit and Will knocks on it, and she's like, I'm busy, he doesn't want to talk to him. And now we're at the point where they're kind of forced to talk to each other, and they uh, they sort of have this... And they sort of have this moment where Chas recognizes that there's a thread between them still, you know, from the Orbital Cluster when they were squad mates, um, that she hasn't remembered quite some time. And she wonders, like, why is Alphabet Squadron not the same as Hound, as the Cavern's Angels? Is because the reality is the Rebellion's always been fighting for their lives. It's always been them on the run. They're the rebels. They're the one fighting an endless war for uh, for trying to bring peace to the galaxy. That's been her whole existence. So it's like now when you flipped that over and they're the leading uh, enforcement in the galaxy and uh, we're starting to look towards a post-war world, Chas is trying to figure out, what does that mean for me? Like, I joined the rebellion to fight and to be a martyr like Jen Erso, but now that we might actually have a chance of winning this thing, am I going to be needed? Am I just a weapon right now for people's, for people's violence, uh, violence uh, delights? Am, am I just kind of mm-hmm. here to to die? Like, what what am I doing? You know, and uh, maybe I should mm-hmm. just go out in a in a blaze of glory. Yeah, and and speaking of that, there's a there's a great scene where Chas and Quell kind of go on a walk and they talk to each other. And she says, you know, what do you want to say to me? Uh, and Quell says, you know, you said the other day that you joined a cult when everything happened at Serveron happened. Quell says, or Chas says, yeah. And she says, I know you don't, you don't join up with just anyone. I'm glad for you. That's my sense anyway. So I figure they're doing right by you somehow. She's kind of respecting that um, maybe Chas has found a different way. And Chas asks, asks, that's it? She says, that's it. And then Chas asks about her tattoo. And then this, this quote from Chas hits and it's, uh-huh. It's, I guess, a foreshadowing of what's to come, but sometimes Chas' lip twitched. She let the words pass through her as if she weren't responsible for the sounds. Sometimes it's easier to have people you trust, even if you don't like them. And Quell says, it gets lonely. She replies, it gets lonely. And then there's a moment, I don't know if it's after or before this, because I did not screenshot it, but uh, where Quell says... You know, I kind of wanted to die in a blaze of glory. Or no, Chas says, I wanted to die in a blaze of glory. And Quell says, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, I mean, that's kind of funny. It's just how, how well they know one another. But I thought that that conversation was just so quiet and small. 
is so valuable for both of these characters because it allows them to reconnect. Even if they don't trust each, even if they don't like each other again yet, they have a trust in one another that what they're going to say to them is say to the other person will be respected and honored and that they can speak to one another as equals even if they haven't forgiven one another yet. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really powerful to say, I know we don't see eye to eye in this moment, but we need each other and we need each other to be honest with ourselves. Did you think Chas was going to be toast in this book? Were you kind of worried for her? I was, I think I was worried for her the most. I was definitely worried for her at a couple of points, but I I kind of felt like she was going to be fine. Yeah. I was worried Kairos was... I, I was worried they were all going to die. I mean... <laughs> Nobody that's makes I was it crying out. At chapter 29. I, I, I was just so worried that more than one of them was going to die or was going to be Kairos because she's the easiest to kill off or it's going to be Chas because she wants to die or, or Nath because he would go in a heroic end or Will because Alexander Freed wanted to be cruel or Quell because, you know, the only way to atone is through death. You can't really atone. You just die. And he didn't do any of that. So <laughs> shout out to my man. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Alexander Freed for being an amazing author. But I, I think with Chas, you know, I think that was one of the most satisfactory things because there is a point during the the battle at Chattawa when they're trying to take down the the uh, Gazanti cruiser, I think it is. And they sort of have to take this like, you know, uh, actually, no, it's at the Battle of Jakku. Excuse me. So it's when they're trying to take down the Yadiz and um chas does her final bombing run in her b-wing and she's like you know i could do this um you know this is this is sort of what i'm i'm this is the finale i've always been waiting for you know this is the thing i wanted to do in the orbital cluster but will lark stopped me this is the thing i wanted to do at pandem nigh but we had to rescue pandem nigh because everything was falling to shit basically um this is what, you know, Jen Erso did at Scarif. This is the Battle of Endor. This is this is it. This is death calling my name. This is my one last chance to be a hero because like I don't want to live in the post-war world. Like fighting a war has been my whole life. So if that's my whole life, the only way my life can end is in a blaze of glory with my name written in the books just like Jen. And mm-hmm. I love when she's like screaming and she going she's going, "I'm winning the war today. I'm winning it." Chasna Chaddock. Thelin, queen of starfighters and fizzy drinks. You remember that. You remember me. And I love that queen. moment. And I love when she's flying and she starts, uh, there's like kind of the rhythmic thing going in her ship, the, the, the mm-hmm. beat of the laser fire hitting her, her, her uh, shields and the sort of thumping in her ship. And she kind of hears it as a rhythm. And even though she doesn't have the music, she starts to kind of, you know, bop to it a little bit and like, you know, kind of get into it and sing a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then Shadowing even joins her singing too like what is happening in this final fight it's crazy and she sort of she sort of has this sort of very tribal moment of of sacrifice and like this is the final moment this is the final moment and and it's just intense this is not in our notes but let's talk about that final fight for a minute and let's talk about how they had an open calm the whole time incredible like let's 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 say some words on that because it is so amazing so so who was it was it will was it will or Hera who was like you know if you can open a comm between between quell and the alphabet squadron members here so they can hear her and i was like oh boy oh boy oh boy oh boy and then they're mad over in alphabet squadron land like oh you know she's over there and i don't want to hear it because it comes at the weirdest yeah, times. Yeah. But and chas thinks fact- she's taunting them in a way yeah, and the fact that or that Alphabet Squadron is communicating with Shadow Wing and they're doing this thing all together. They clearly have a lot of contempt for one another and are not happy with one another and are just set to kill them. And they're ultimately, at the end of the day, realize that they're in a war and they're going to do what they have to do. But the fact that they are going through all of the names of the people who have died, who they want to avenge, the fact that they're doing that all together the fact that they're doing who, what, where all together, the fact that they ultimately sing all together is devastating and thrilling and amazing to read because it it tells you that there's humanity in every single one of these people. Some They're just on different sides. And I'm not saying that what the Empire's side is doing is okay that their whole philosophy is okay. But if you like, think back to Lost Stars and how... Um, 
when the Death Star blows up and both um, Thane and Sienna had friends that they knew, people that ultimately they, they were Imperials with on the Death Star that died. And they saw them as friends and they saw them as genuine people and they were on the wrong side. And um, Sienna is on the wrong side, but she is still a person who has friends and mourns them. And so is Thane. And so are all of these characters in, in this book. And it's kind of devastating to hear about all of the names they have lost. And it's amazing to read. It's so clever. It's so clever of Alexandra to just add that. Again, that one last thing. It's like, even though the Battle of Jakku is happening, even though there's Pew Pew happening, he still finds a way to slip in. Like, it's still character driven. Like, of course, yeah. the, 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 the radi- radioactive particles that the, that the uh, shadowing has weaponized is shutting off all their comms. So they just have to keep that open comm channel. And of course, shadowing can hear them on that open comm channel, right? So it's like just the, mm-hmm. that one extra dynamic that makes that final fight so satisfying. And, you know, it, it hearkening back to when they're both on their separate ships and they're, like you said, they're singing to each other. They're having chats with each other. Um, Will Lark is the one who starts it. And, you know, they sing the the uh, the Kuntavarian Fall, which is on page 167, where it says three and three, the agons rolled as clouds did clash and the rain did pour and soldiers strong and mothers bold wept for the city they had adored. And they're singing sea shanties to each other. It's great. <laughs> we love it's it. It's fantastic. I will say it's amazing to me that Will sticks so hard to his moral line and that he doesn't give up on the members of Shadow Wing, nope. even though it's it's clear that he probably should. Because he when they're broadcasting for hours and hours and hours just into the universe, hoping that Shadow Wing will hear them and change their mind and understand that who these people are. And then Oh my god, when we get that final showdown with Blink. Epic. And 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 he kind of realizes like, oh my gosh, you know, like I have to, I have to save myself here. It's it's not a matter. I see this person, I see this person, but they are in this moment. They have not changed. And I I can't win and ultimately have to run away from that before they before uh Palal's kills them. It's uh it's pretty sad um, that Will didn't seem to really change anyone's mind, and it's <laughs> now that I think of it, like it's it's a little depressing. But um, it also is really amazing to see Will not compromise on who he is in that moment. One of the most pivotal conversations for me in the book where I knew that this book was just going to emotionally devastate me was after Will spoke to the Paulinian elder who said that he was the last one of the 120. They had either died or all come home. And he was the last one that was still with the Republic or with the rebellion um, slash new Republic. And that hit home so hard because all he has wanted to do this entire time. Shadowfall opens with him thinking about Polyneus. And the, the thing that the elder says is, now you are the last, Will Lark. Your people await you. So now he has the burden of, of um, he wants to go home. The people want to see him. And he is at the end of his rope. He says, I've been here in a year after, um, a year after Endor. And now I am done i am done and that just has to be my decision and so this is after he's injured and nath is so happy that his net or that will is distracted and worked and he goes on and on and on and on will asks did you save chawada chadawa and he says yeah yeah we saved chadawa he says thank you i'm so sorry i doubted you thank you and then he kind of pauses and he says, wait, there's something I didn't want to tell you. Please listen. And then he says, I spoke to Polyneus. I spoke to the elders. They told me, they told me, Nath, that I'm the last. His eyelids fluttered like he was fighting off exhaustion. The last of the 120. Everyone else, the others who fought, they're all home now. All except for me. And then he says, I want to go. I'm ready to go home. I... 
everything came into such a sharp focus in that moment. And I don't know if you had the same experience with um, that conversation, Brad, but everything made sense for Will's character. Everything had always made sense for Will's character, but that is the moment where I decided, oh, Will is not about me. You know, Will is not my about my adoration of Will. Will is about himself and his connection to home and his connection to his values and his morals. And I thought that conversation between the two of them, where the two of them diverge in that moment, Nath has not quite understood what he heard. And when Will makes the choice to not join the Jack who fight in a starship and kind of abandon his post as commander or captain, uh, Will is, or Nath is like, I'm done with you. We're done. This relationship is over. You're abandoning me. And to Will, it's not, he's disappointed that about it, but he's like, this is not, that's not necessarily what it means. He is saying that he has to make this decision for himself. And it's amazing because, uh, Will and Quell also have a conversation that's a bit of a heart to heart. And Quell apologizes to Will while they're both kind of in the medic area and says, I'm so sorry that I left you. I didn't mean to leave you in command, which is not something you wanted. And she breaks down. And everybody is having these realizations about one another, or rather, these realizations about Will, I guess, and who he is. And it was really kind of devastating to finally see him, for these characters to finally see him as who he truly is. Not a, not a pilot, necessarily, not a man of war, but a boy who was one of 120 who left his planet and is the last one. He has given more time than anybody else. And I think they finally understand his position. And his point of view and his and his loneliness and his his homesickness in a way that they hadn't before. It's sort of this innocence that that Will Lark has, and it's actually kind of kicked in for me too during that scene when Nath leaves the operating suite and it says he barely saw the burning ships behind the face of a homesick child covered in dust and blood. So mm-hmm. it's kind of just this image of like Will Lark who has never really known when the right time to go home is because the war just keeps lasting. It keeps happening. It keeps going on and on and on. It's this like endless feeling. And it's like, when do we stop fighting? When do we stop going back and forth? Because we can't slaughter every single Imperial that's out there. We have to, at some point, try to have some peace. Try to persuade one another that it's not just about vengeance. It's, you know, vengeance only breeds martyrs. We have to come to a resolution because like, you know, and then Nath think that's, you know, thinks that's just really unrealistic. But even Nath towards the end, I think he wants to go home. He wants to step away. He wants to go home and be a pirate, but he realizes that at some point your luck runs out. You know, you win medal after medal and put out fire after fire. But it's like, when is that when does when does your time run out and for nath he doesn't mm-hmm. want to see that day because he's not going to die feeling complacent he's going to die feeling regret that he couldn't do more and so he kind of wants sure. this more uh, this life of freedom but for himself whereas in a way like will wants the freedom i think to still help others like he still wants to be in the the quote unquote fight but for you know the fight for peace the fight for uh, a new republic sort of the uh diplomatic solution not the aggressive negotiations that that's will lark right Mm -hmm. so it is interesting this whole scene and i think it it really is when it hits you you're like wow will lark is a child basically he's a baby and he just wants to go home yeah and he's the last of his people that need to come home and he was never ready for this war i don't think truly Sarah, one final thought I had on Nath and Will. I want to talk about Will's Captain America moment. Oh, okay. So you remember in like, Cap- I think it's Captain America Civil War. <laughs> Do you remember when Cap like holds the helicopter? Yeah. And then like holds the building? I do. And like, and his like biceps are like breaking through his skin. Yeah. Okay, so that happened to Will Lark in this book. <laughs> so like when 
when like Will is pulling Nath out of the uh the vacuum of space that that one room is like kind of open. Yes. Oh my god. And he's like, Grr! and like Nath's choking, and his like face is purple, and he's like trying. He needs to breathe, and they have to like pull him in. Yeah. I thought that was a really epic moment. Mm-hmm. Just wanted to acknowledge how Will Lark is actually Chris Evans because <laughs> literally on the cover of this book he looks like Chris Evans. So. Will Lark, if he's in a movie ever, he needs to be played by Chris Evans, is my point. Okay. Anyways, somebody from Delray make that happen. <laughs> Anyways. I don't think they'd be the ones to make that happen, but okay. Well, never say never. All right. But I loved how it described it. It, says it said his muscles were in rebellion. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> but that, that leads me to, uh, we're going to start talking about Quell and um, sort of uh, her journey throughout the book. And uh, that starts with, this quote from will when he thinks about nath actually and but it makes me think about i I think it's an important concept for quell um because after this whole moment they have this fierce embrace they hug it out and uh will is kind of questioning nath's loyalty to others and if it's driven by personal greed or like a true reverence for life and it kind of goes back to you know their disagreement that they had in shadowfall but it says here quote if will looked askance at any act nath took attributed every sacrifice he made to ulterior motives only a secret deed will never heard about would be evidence of heroism so it's kind of like you know what are your intentions on judging people you know are you always thinking there's some ulterior ulterior motive to their actions because if you always think that with every single thing a person does you're never going to see their true heart and you're never going to see like you know the good and the deeds that they do it's only going to be something that you don't see Mm -hmm. that proves they're a good person right so I think when you think about that in the context of Quell, Will, knowing what he knows about Quell and, you know, being responsible for Necronus, he could think that, you know, everything that she does has an ulterior motive. But I think it's with this interaction with Nath and his thoughts about Nath that it kind of translates over to Quell when, you know, they eventually kind of forgive each other and they reunite later on. And I think, you know, that's why he has sort of an open mind even though there is something that he kind of questions earlier in the book when he talks with Chas, which is the, the Endor scene when he blew my mind. Mm -hmm. We find out that Will Lark stood in the forest, like a creeper staring (laughs) at Luke Skywalker over Vader's funeral pyre. And that's, I was like, of course Luke Skywalker is brought up somehow. You gotta, you gotta bring up Luke. But I forgive Alexander Freed for it because this is, this is actually, this is actually <laughs> How dare great. you commit this, great... this sin, but it's okay, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> but this is like an actual perfect use of Luke, right? It's not like yeah. a nostalgic thing. It's like a real story beat that matters. Mm-hmm. It says here, when Will is reminiscing on this, it says, quote, It was that look he had, like he was remembering Vader's life. Like he felt grief. I don't Scott, I don't doubt Skywalker did all the good they say, but it felt wrong to have Vader there when we had just lost so many people fighting everything Vader represented. I don't know what Vader meant to him. I believe in grace and compassion that no one deserves to die in war. Even so, I watched Skywalker and Vader, and I can't shake the thought that maybe there are some crimes that shouldn't be forgiven. That there are some lines we shouldn't cross. He didn't say Quell's name, but he didn't have to. So amazing stuff right there right it's like you know outsider looking in why is luke skywalker mourning the loss of darth vader Mm -hmm. and uh, you know i think uh will's original thinking is this sort of again like with nath there's always an ulterior motive or should i should i think that or is that wrong for me to think likewise like should i think that there are some crimes that shouldn't be forgiven maybe but will like he says here is somebody that believes in grace and compassion so when quell comes back he kind of accepts her with with open arms and you know, as we transition to Quell and, and know that, you know, from her perspective, she really regrets all the things that she did at Necronus and really uh, wishes that, not that it didn't happen, but that she could move forward from it and show other people that she's worth more than that. I don't know what you think of, of sort of what Quell went through in this book, but um, what do you think is kind of her, the most important aspect of her journey in this book? Like, where does she start? And how does she kind of work through the things that she has done in her life and, like, you know, the dark deeds that she's committed? Like the key, the key to Quell happens in this, this conversation that she has with Ido in her head. And what I think about her arc in this 
series and specifically within this book is that we finally learn who she is and what she fights for. And ultimately, she wants to save lives. She wants to have compassion for others. She wants to see Soren as her mentor and hold all of the pieces of him together. She wants to save the rebellion and the empire at the same time or the members of the rebellion at the empire at the same time and i think her story throughout the book is that of figuring out what you fight for and understanding the consequences of your actions and the mistakes of your past and understanding that m- not everyone is going to forgive you and that not everyone is going to understand where you are today. They'll just see where you were then and that you have to be able to live with that and you have to find a way forward. Do you agree with that? I mean, did you pull something different from that? Well, yeah, it's kind of the idea of like, you know, when, when, when people do bad things, again, it depends on the severity of the thing. Like, do we expel them from society forever? Do we give them a chance to, you know, uh, live with what they've done? Again, case by case, there are some things, you know, that that kind of go beyond this. But it's it's just sort of that question of where do we draw the line? Like, when do we give people a second chance? And I think the the funny thing about Quill is she goes back to shadowing because she says, you know, my squad mates figured out I did Necronus. You know, I was responsible for it. Maybe I can do some good if I just go back and destroy shadowing from the inside. Then she gets the shadowing and her mission kind of becomes a little bit kerfuffled. If that's the best word to describe it, it's like sort of uh, the lies start to become intertwined with each other. And the thing that she set out initially to do is sort of like, is that what I want to do now? Because and it goes back to that conversation with Aichio, like you said, because she's like, why? why am I feeling like this all of a sudden? Like, why do I feel like even though I want to go back to shadow wing and kill everybody and, you know, make them be destroyed. Why is it now that I'm realizing that Imperial soldiers don't deserve to die? Mm-hmm. And this is on page 302. And ITO says, because when you accepted that you were worthy of existence, worthy of moving forward as you decided you would, you could no longer deny your former comrades, the same worth and dignity. It merely took you the time to see the logical conclusion. And Yurika says, I don't get to place myself above them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when he asks her, what do you want to do? She says, I want to save lives. And he says, so start there. So it's this idea that like, well, you know, she she kind of villainized shadowing. And then she realizes like, wait, I used to be part of shadowing. And like, look, I made a life for myself as part of Alphabet Squadron. But because I hid my past and didn't tell people about it, it actually burned me in the ass in the end. Mm-hmm. So she's saying, you know, like, why do, why would I initially think I'm any better than shadowing? Like, why would I think I'm above them and I can forgive myself, but I don't have it in my heart to forgive them. So she starts to realize like, you know, just like Will Lark thinks, you know, and gra- he believes in grace and compassion. I think Quill starts to, th- to think the same way. And I think that's why they have such a heart to heart before she goes to Coruscant. And it's, it's ultimately why she kind of believes in this future where, People don't have to hide who they are. Yeah. Because she hid herself from Alphabet Squadron and it only ever hurt her more. Mm Mm-hmm. And in recognizing the humanity, like that that you're worthy of existence and so therefore is everyone else, that she is able to have compassion for how they got to be where they were. And and she has compassion for keys, even though she sees that he was a ringleader of so much of this destruction. She she understands his motives of wanting to be loyal to his people. And for her the her people in Shadow Wing, she understands that some of them are very young and some of them aren't here by choice. And some of them stayed because they had compassion for one another and wanted to be there for one another. And wanting to to purely save lives is is um noble and She's doing that, though, understanding that she is very flawed herself and everyone may not believe her when she says that that's her goal. And that's that's a pill that she just has to swallow and, and keep moving forward on. 
Yeah, and you know, let's talk about Soren and 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 Quell to wrap up our our sort of character conversation before we really hit home the main theme of Victory's Price and kind of you know distill it into what it truly is. But you know, Soren's whole dilemma in this book is you know is the Empire just, and is there fairness and justice with the the Republic as sort of the the dominating political party? Right? Mm-hmm. Can can the rebels judge the fates of their em- enemies fairly? That's the big question. Can there be forgiveness? And Soren ultimately thinks there there can't be forgiveness, and it's kind of ominous when the Emperor's messenger shows up and starts yelling, you know, defiance. Yeah. And it's sort of like a, it's almost like a, a foreboding moment where it's like, ah, yes, the Emperor's messenger with this, you know, giant algorithm could tell when somebody was defiant and when somebody would carry out, you know, Operation Cinder. And it's sort of like, you know, calling people out for their, uh, for their, uh, not inhumaneness, but their mistakes that they've made in the past. You know, he the reason he fights is because otherwise, you know, if he accepts defeat, he's going to sacrifice every soldier who remains alive at the altar of rebel justice. And he says, you and I have both seen what happens to those who seek another path. We both know the people here have no choice. So I think the thing that, you know, even though they are a bit different, they're also very much one and the same because they both tried to escape shadowing. And they both ended up coming back to shadowing, right? Because they realized the life Mm -hmm. they were trying to live wasn't working out. I think they have different reasons as to why those lives working weren't working out. And for Soren, he thinks it's because, you know, his Imperial record can never be expunged. Mm-hmm. Whereas Quell realizes her rebel life wasn't working because she was hiding her Imperial life. Mm-hmm. That's the reason things went wrong for her. Would you agree with that? That's kind of their two sides that they see. Um, yeah. You know, opposite of each other. Yeah. And there's a moment when um, they're having that conversation through text uh, when Quell reaches out to Soren where... Soren thinks to himself, I'm sorry, perhaps we should have stayed where we were instead of initiating this whole sequence of events. And I think they have a lot of uh, uh, respect and understanding for one another and the decisions they've had to make, even if they disagree with the philosophy behind those decisions, if that makes sense. They don't agree with the path, but they understand why the path is taken. And it's interesting to me that they both found themselves back at shadowing at a point in time because they realized that they couldn't quite shake this part of their identity and that them leaving shadowing alone would not fulfill their point of view for for keys it was to set an example and hope that people would do the other other things for for quell it was um that she she can fix her mistakes and can in a way, absolve herself from some of the pain that she caused by by creating a good in the world. And obviously, she knows that she can't get rid of her past mistakes, but she hopefully can make something right by by ending shadowing. And uh, it's interesting because Keys is the person who sets them on that path, sets both of them on that path. Right at Necronus when when he tells her to leave shadowing, mm-hmm. and it's it's just funny how they end up coming back together. Yeah, and they're both a little skeptical of each other. And <laughs> she's like, is he on to me? And there's one she's like, yeah. definitely on to me, you know? Um, so it's interesting. So let's get to the final fight. Yeah. With Soren and with Quell and the moment that they're in the databank together. And I think this is kind of the, the most pivotal moment of the entire trilogy. Mm-hmm. Soren makes a comment about how, you know, the Emperor's cruelty touched everybody in service. He says, quote, how many of them compromise their ethics to avoid rebuke or protect their families or out of pure expediency? It was the design of the empire to compromise its servants so that we were bound by guilt. Mm. And he's like, wait, okay, listen, suppose your, your new Republic is fair. How many Imperials are going to live in fear the rest of their lives? How are they going to be scared? They're going to be hauled away for decades old crimes. How many soldiers will wonder when some functionary will publicize their records, resulting in mobs descending on their homes and families. Now, to me, the fact that the Empire touched every single one of its servants and everybody is complicit some way or another, there's going to be something that can be pulled pretty much for anybody that worked in the Empire from this databank. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the question is, what do the life for these people look like? And I think both Quell and Soren see a life of, they want a life of freedom. Like they want the same thing, but the way in which they achieve that isn't the same. So for Soren, he sees that as like, let's wipe away all crimes. Like, you know, 
how many, you know, suppose your republic is fair. Like, how many people are going to live in fear the rest of their lives, worrying that, you know, their their crimes from a decade ago are going to get publicized and, you know, mobs are going to descend on their homes and families. Like, that's not a galaxy I want to live in. There can't be any goodwill in that galaxy. There's no union. Uh, he says, quote, at worst, such resentment could provoke terrorism and civil war such that a few thousand dead civilians on Coruscant would seem trivially, trivial indeed. And he's referencing the fact that he would drop the data bank uh, towards the lower levels of Coruscant and kill thousands of citizens in the process. But it's worth it, he says, at the price of freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's his price of his victory, right? But for, for Erica Quell, she says, you know, they're going to actually have to live under a shadow the rest of their lives. You know, she says, quote, leaving shadowing didn't cure the sickness in me. It just made it easier to ignore. So maybe they're free. But they're eaten away from the inside, damn no matter what we do, because it's too late for them to choose what really matters. And the cost is a galaxy where people get away with genocide. Mm -hmm. You think that's going to bring peace? You think ignoring the Empire's crimes won't make it easier for the worst of us to keep committing atrocities? That is, again, forgetting the past. You think forgetting genocide is going to solve our issue. That's No, it's just going to make the genocide happen again. And she says, here's the truth, Soren. We were murderous bastards, and being true to one another doesn't make it any better. It just means we don't stop and we don't figure out how bad it's gotten. Yeah. I've accepted what I've done. I've tried to move past my guilt because it stopped being useful long ago, but I haven't gotten for Necronus or anything else. I live with the memory of what I'm capable of every day. I need the memory to do better. And wiping out the records of what we've done seems like an awful lot like helping everyone else forget. That's it. That's her. That's her whole point in this trilogy is listen my entire time with alphabet squadron i've been trying to forget who i was thinking it would make me a better person but the reality is i've always needed to embrace who i am and i need that memory to make sure i grow from it because mm -hmm. if that memory is gone i have no baseline to grow from and that's what she's saying here is we can't forget this genocide they both want the same thing but quell's version of freedom is you live with that the rest of your life and you use it to fuel you to be a more positive person and and and, and promote change in society for the better and actually contribute to society. Yeah, and in a part, you can understand where Soren is, is getting his point of view. You can understand what leads him to that framework. Yes. But when Quell lays down the law right here and says, we will be eaten out from the inside no matter what. And it's not that anybody's forgetting what happened here. And we need to feel this and to remember this in order to move forward. It's, it's really important. And I would just like to recommend um, Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men. It's a book about ordinary men in the Holocaust who joined the Nazis. It's an incredible piece of uh, research and history and really hits on what Quell is talking about when, when she says, you know, we were, we were bound to one another and we respected one another, but that doesn't make what we did any okay or better or, and we still committed these atrocities and we, we are capable of these horrible things. Um, and that's my, that's my aside because that guilt, that act, once you do it, you can't take it back and you have to figure out the world has to figure out what it's going to do with you and you have to figure out what you're going to do with you. And, um, it's very interesting that the conversation was approached in this way because it allowed us to really understand Quell and understand what it means to be accountable to yourself and accountable to others. Well, I think with that, Sarah, I think it, it you know, that feels like a natural transition to part three, which is Victory's Price. Part three. This is where I want to talk about kind of wrapping up all of those character moments that we talked about and all of those themes. And I really want to ask a couple questions here is like, for you, what does justice look like? in the new republic like what what do we do with the imperials like what is the right thing to do and like you know clearly it seems like we both think soren was justified in wanting to get rid of it in some fashion um but i think you know and, and quell is kind of uh on to the right path as well mm -hmm. um but she's still a little uncertain right she's like i'm not going to be the one that makes the choice but you know i want to at least have the capacity for somebody else to make the choice mm -hmm. which will be mothma yeah but what what is your idea of justice in the in the new republic I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's um, a perfect way to answer that. And I feel that Mothma and Hera and the New Republic in general 
isn't a hundred percent sure where they're going with that either. And and when they're thinking about Quell and the fact that she is um the first person that they are going to deal with, um, with regards to her actions during the war, she Mothma is saying, Well, we could put her on trial and lock her away and these records will be public and people will know what we did. People will know what we did here. And I think it's Hera who says, you know, I do want to say we would forgive her if this were the rebellion. And there's this thing that I think they come to that is recognizing the humanity of every person and recognizing that they made a mistake and not letting them get away with it, but allowing them to live at the same time. And in a lot of ways for our own world, that's very utopian. But I think it's also very bold and and fascinating to see how they worked through that and how it worked out for them because we kind of get the populists and the centrists, you know, in 25 years from now. And then we see somebody like Ransom Castorfo who has uh, imperial memorabilia throughout his office, which is fascinating. Um, but But they are saying, well, maybe we limit the voting rights. Maybe we don't let them have government contracts. Maybe we lock them away. Maybe, you know, maybe we do all these things in order to figure out a balance between understanding who they are as people and holding them accountable for their, for their work. So I think they find justice as some sort of, of middle ground. And there's also this thing called the Reconciliation Project, which means that people are meeting, meeting and sitting down and working together um, on a personal level to come to some sort of forgiveness and um, understanding. And I think that's pretty, pretty bold as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes to the, the conversation with Mothma and Hera, I think, is like one of the other really important ones in the book, mm-hmm. maybe besides Quell and Soren's final conversation. But I, I love that we get, Moth, you know, quality Mothma content here. <laughs> we love it. She, sa- she says, I believe in justice. I also believe that for a galaxy to survive, reconciliation must occur. Again, the reconciliation project. Mm-hmm. The New Republic will not hold together if we spend the next 10 or 20 or 50 years divided into rebel and imperial. Yet true reconciliation requires honesty. It requires we stare at what we've done as a civilization and to come to terms with it. The data bank can help, but only if the Senate and the galaxy as a whole has the appetite for self-examination over revenge. So I think what this quote by Mothma perfectly, perfectly encapsulates is like both Soren's vision and Quell's vision, right? Yeah. Because Mothma says we can't spend the next 50 years fighting very polarized us on very polarized sides as rebel and imperial right and that's that's kind of soren's worst fear is like you know living in paranoia all the time and fighting each other and you know war after war and it's just it's horrible so it's better to wipe the slate clean right and just everybody's on the same side because there is no there it's a blank slate for everybody great but quell's side is that honesty part the the honesty that we have to look and come to terms with what we've done and uh we need to self-examine so Mothma kind of gets right to the root of exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. They might not do it perfectly, but I think the actual ideal of, you know, what does atonement look like in the society of the New Republic? You know, how do you to- atone for your actions, whether or not you were complicit in them or, you know, you're, you're somewhat tainted by some action somebody took somewhere in the Empire that somehow ended up on your lap, you know, because uh, I think to some degree everybody's responsible for the things that happened in the Empire, but um, to larger or lesser degrees, right? So it's like, how do we forgive others um, and ourselves, right? And, and ourselves. I, think, I think the fact that they give Quell freedom, you know, not necessarily a full pardon, but it's kind of showing that there is some sort of path to normalcy for people. And, you know, the question for Quell of, like, what does she deserve is not really one the government's going to answer. That's more for philosophers, <laughs> Hera jokes. Mm-hmm. But she's like, listen, this is what, we're, what, this is what we've come to, you know, like, you're kind of the you're kind of the example and and i i think the fact that the ex imperials make up such a large portion of the population um that example does need to send a message about like what's going to happen with the things that you've done in the past and it's it's redemption is so core to star wars it's such a core theme and this is really again the first story that we've seen about atonement at least in my mind where you know quell didn't die she gets to live with what she's done 
for the rest of her life yeah and grow beyond it yeah and in something like resistance you know we obviously have tam going to uh going to the the first order but she comes back and her family her, her found family accepts her in that but we don't really get like the the deep emotional weightiness of of being a part of that order that we do in this book and obviously they're for different audiences so i don't necessarily expect that with resistance but what i'm trying to highlight is is that this is really the first space where we've really explored that and these weighty emotions that um somebody would be dealing with and i think it's really powerful <laughs> and also really hilarious that harris says you know what you deserve the question for the philosophers do you really expect us um a baby government of only a year old to to be perfect and give you and and to do the do the most perfect justice ever like we are not equipped to be all-knowing we are not equipped necessarily to be wise even in our own government we're still working to build this baby thing and what we're doing now is setting the example and hopefully leading us down a path that we recognize uh, compassion and understanding and the value of living atonement and forgiveness. And I think that's awesome. You know, I thought it was really interesting how Hera said she, she felt it was wrong that they're harder on people now that they've won. Mm-hmm. How, whereas if like in the rebellion, somebody like Yurika, they just would have accepted with open arms and they did. for the most part, yeah. you know, because they were still rebels back then. And that's what they needed to do. They just forgive people and get more people into the fold and to help out, you know, somebody like Callus mm -hmm. in Star Wars Rebels. And I just thought it was interesting how like, you know, Mothma's like, we don't have that luxury anymore. You know, we're, we're kind of a, a shifting and chaotic storm uh, and we have to rebuild uh, where a fortress stood before. And we have to consider, you know, whether every stone that we place on this new fortress is going to be able to carry the entire weight of the future. Yeah. You know, like if one stone in that entire structure is weak or uh, doesn't represent the rest of the structure, doesn't fit with the rest of it, it all crumbles. So, you know, uh, it's just great. But then Mothma's like, wait, but if we lock Yerka Quell up for her crimes, what hope do any of them have? Yeah. So that's why her, as the first example of somebody to get, you know, acquitted, sends a message of like, listen, it's not always going to be an acquittal, but there is a possibility depending on your actions mm -hmm. and who you want to be moving forward. Yeah. It's, it's just great. Like, I, I, you know, the, the price of victory, what do you think the, how would you summarize the price of victory to wrap up your final thoughts on like, what is the price of victory? Like, what does that mean? Who carries the price of victory? We all carry the price of victory. Every member, I mean, <laughs> we as the readers carry the price of victory. Um, but, but in all reality, I think every, every character, every person who was involved in one way or another carries the price of their loss or their victory. And the price of victory is knowing you went through a war and knowing that everyday people fought on both sides of that war and died. And knowing that you had some part in that. And to understand that and to yet move forward and attempt to still build something new and better. And like to have optimism through it all. And I think that that's really powerful and really radical in a lot of ways. Because it's saying that I, it's saying I saw the worst of us. I maybe was the worst of us, but I know that is not all of who I am and not all of who we are. And I believe that we can be more than our worst moments. And then mm -hmm. when we felt the lowest, when we committed something or when we committed an atrocity, when we did something to regret or didn't make a choice that we should have made, that I am more than that and all of us that we are more than that. And that we can work to build something better than that. And I think that rocks. <laughs> it does. We need that kind of message. Because like, again, all the critics of Kylo Ren who are like, he destroyed a planet. He's so bad. You know, that's an extreme example for sure. But I think ultimately Star Wars is a fictional space wizard movie. And uh, it's, it's a, not it's always. It's a fiction? It's, it's not a one time. <laughs> right, Sarah. It's faking in space. What? 
it's not a one to one comparison, right? So because you sympathize with a character like Kylo Ren who destroyed a planet, or because you sympathize with a character like Yurka Quill who also destroyed a planet, um, those two characters are not uh, not alike. They are very alike, actually, quite alike, because they both deal with the demons of their past uh, and try to figure out how can they move forward. And it's not always the easiest answer, um, but it's the answer that they ultimately come to, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're, you're, you're supposed to forgive these characters and you're supposed to feel that in The Rise of Skywalker. You're supposed to feel that in Victory's Price that, listen, even though these people did some very bad things, uh, we can forgive them for it, right? So, like, when you translate this to our real society it's like if we don't forgive people in real life who've made mistakes again depending on the degree of the mistake clearly what choice does anybody in the entire world have if they make a mistake we all make mistakes all the time but like if if it's just like you know we make a mistake and that's it like what's the point of living what's the point of life Mm -hmm. you know if 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 we're just only defined by the mistake and you know not the ability to move forward and remember the mistake and be held accountable for that mistake, but to not let it like, you know, consume us forever because it's like, what choice does Kylo Ren have to be Ben Solo again? What choice does Erica Quill have to live a life with Chas on Spirana and, and love her and kiss her and care for her and grow old with her? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the price of victory is like, you know, uh, it's not just, uh, the win and the loss. It's, um, you know, what kind of life does everybody get to live afterwards? And who gets to decide that and uh, what is fair? Um, because, yeah. 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 I don't know where I was going with that, but, yeah. I, you know, well, I'm I, saying a lot of words. Yeah. And I think that you're, <laughs> I think the thing with forgiveness and letting Eureka walk free and live her life is it's the power of forgiveness. Not every single individual has to forgive every other individual. As you've been saying, it you know, depends on the severity, you know, uh, depends on if it happened to you or, you know, forgiveness, right. forgiveness. I can forgive something, somebody for something that didn't directly happen to me, but like, I don't have the power to forgive them on the behalf of the person they hurt. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yep. And I think that's the same in, in this space fiction, um, is that. It's the power of forgiveness, the ability that we're allowing other people to have the capacity to forgive. And that's what something that the Reconciliation Project is so interesting that that a title like that is mentioned because it's allowing people to have avenues to direct forgiveness. And that is can be a really powerful and really freeing thing. Um, And I just I just love this last chapter. (laughs) It's really good. The, the last chapter is called Enduring Scars of Flesh and Spirit. So I think that's an amazing, amazing chapter name because when you think of the word enduring, right? Long lasting, it, it, it perseveres, it, it continues on. And when you look at the scars that you've gotten from war and from the scars that have affected both your flesh and your spirit, right? The, the things that have, have kind of broken your spirit in two do those scars endure? Do those scars heal over time? Yeah, they do. They, they it takes time for them to heal. Uh, Kairos is healing. I just think the idea of like, you know, we endure through the hardship and we see that with Quill, right? We see her and, and Chas living together and, you know, Will comes to visit them and he, he notices, you know, you, you guys look good for each other. You, you needed each other. And this is this is the reason that we fought. This is the reason that Chas didn't die in a blaze of glory. This is for this moment. Even though Chas, you know, had those really rough days where she hid her blaster just to make toying with it even harder, and she had dark thoughts, and she lived in a really shabby apartment building with a bunch of death stack addicts. Um, it eventually brought all those things brought her to Erica. They brought her to this moment to, you know, them drunkenly arguing over how Chas wants to go into town and fight the, quote, human supremacist bastards at the port security office. (laughs) She is 100% right about this, though. Uh, Listen, I want to go to the bar with Chas so bad. I want to see what what fights she gets into. Well, yeah, I'll support her. But like, yeah, I yeah, she's 100% just in all of the fights that she takes on. And I imagine that living in a time during the empire was very difficult for her as a non-human and she mentions this as like all of the at the shooting range in the death star is all non-humans and i'm like oh, oh yeah, i'm really yeah. glad you brought that up yeah, yeah that's that um, was a that was a deep cut in that in that 
uh, that philosophy is clearly continuing in, in the minds of some and, uh, and it, it still sucks. Um, more, more non-human species main characters in Star Wars canon, please. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> But what did you think of this final dinner with each, with them? Did you? I mean, this is six years after, you know, the the final battle of Jakku. I mean, like, did you feel again when we talk about happy endings? Like, this is like ideal, right? This is like them all getting together, family reunion. Nath and Kairos aren't there. Nath is off doing his pirate thing. Although I think Will maybe got to him a little bit before, you know, their final send off. Uh, you know how Will was kind of telling him he's a good leader. He should fight still for the New Republic, even though. Nath feels that's not for him, but he thinks to himself, eh, maybe Karen Aiden, you might get your dream to come true one day. Uh, you know, he's out there. And then Kairos is out there somewhere too. So like, you know, even though the two of them weren't there, but the five of them survived, like, did this just warm your heart? Cause I, I just felt so like blessed to have this scene. I'll go back to it every now and again, probably. All right. We've gotten to the point where I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yeah. This this scene uh, is really really special, and it's heartbreaking and beautiful and absolutely necessary all at the same exact time. And I think it's quite incredible that they've come together and and are moving forward in their own ways and allowing themselves to grow with one another. And even if they don't get together as much as they you know would like to or just not often they they still got together here and um will has obviously changed his position in life he doesn't really fly anymore uh and i i, I would like to highlight this this is just a line where it says he rarely flew and i would love to contrast that with um during the duel earlier in the book it says the longer the duel went on the more will's mood will's mood lifted even as his body tired he forgot how fighting the how little flying a starfighter resembled flying the Sir Avka, forgotten how he used to fly by the prickle of his nerves and the rush of the wind through the beast's down. The loss of the A-Wing's computers brought back sensations he had repressed. And to just think that he's lost all of that because of the war, and it's so devastating. But then you see him have this new life with being a leader in his community and being a leader in the galaxy for this reconciliation project and being a senator and having his voice matter to to so many to the people of Polynius and in the galaxy for for everybody who suffered loss and that's amazing and the fact that quell is in on that is amazing and also the fact that we learned that all three of them are lgbtq in this end scene like confirmed is amazing um <laughs> <laughs> I I I mean, <laughs> oh, it's so good! It's so good, and the fact that like Chas and Quill kiss, Chas... we got kissing in Star Wars. Freed gave us a kiss. He did, and the fact that <sighs> so good. Chas and Quell have an understanding and a respect for one another, and clearly have grown not only to trust one another, as we got earlier in that conversation, but to like one another and to not be lonely. And yeah, that's, that's, that's really, I mean, you can really obviously empathize the most with someone you went through something major with, right? Um, think of, think of Katniss and Peeta in the Hunger Games, even though I was a Gale girl, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> uh, clear, like, obviously they've gone through this thing together and they've continued to grow together and forgive one another and and not only trust one another but come to enjoy one another's company in a true true sense of the word is good feelings good happy feelings and it makes me feel com like it, it comforts me that there are, neither of them are alone i just think of them all like sitting in lawn chairs outside like sipping you know sipping their drinks and the night sky is just above and it's just them three and that's it that's all that matters they no longer have to fight a war they can just enjoy each other's company. Chas can go to bed drunkenly. And, you know, Yurika can come home and see her there. And she's like, oh, what are you doing? Like, I just got one other thing to figure out, you know, or do, to do or whatever. And, you know, Quill takes one final flight, which is just like, you know, the final Ooh. line of the book is her is her going through this this thing. She never wants to get forget the sensation of flying, right? And it says for the final line of the book, quote, 
she would never stop thinking about Necronus, but Yerkaquel soared and it was joyful. Literally, like the line encapsulates everything, right? It's 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 the most extreme juxtaposition you could think of, right? Because you have she would never stop thinking about Necronus, the horrible, most awful thing she's ever been a part of in her life. However, she soared and she was joyful about soaring. No matter what you do, you can still find that moment of joy. You can still soar. You can still find a better life. And this last line is just like, there's hope for all of us, right? There's hope for everybody that, you know. Yeah. <sighs> so that's, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. And she kind of not has fully forgiven herself, but has allowed herself to, to be happy. Yeah. And I think that's. She's free. It's so key. It's so key to give yourself permission. Yeah. That's it. That's all I want to say. She found it within herself to move move on, you know? And uh, I think that speaks to the strength of uh, Erica. And yeah. she's an incredible character. So I think yeah. this is one of the best, uh, this is one of the best lines of Star Wars, period. Uh, this, these two sentences right here. So... Uh, yeah, again, it's so just, we've been blessed it's just with incredible that, stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know what else to say on that topic, but I no. just, you know, I think this is uh, the best book series, and, and this is the, the reason why here. So, Sarah, yeah. we're going to move on now to our last part here, which is odds and ends. Let's do it. Rapid fire odds and so ends. So we're going to kind of, sp- we're going to rapid fire this yeah. up, right? Yeah. So we are going to talk about just the things that we love the most. So why don't uh-huh. you start with our number one? All right. At the Nettlich compound, six days after Endor, the local military was overthrown by the droids, who claimed independence for the outpost and the right to self-governance. And then they ruled over the humans. Incredible stuff. Love it. Ridiculous. Goes back so to good. things like L- people like L3, well, or droids like L3. I guess she's a, as a person. She's a droid, but she's also a person. Um, and droid rights. Love that little inclusion. Made that place a lot more interesting. So that's that. Awesome. My thing is the part one chapter names. Oh, yeah. Do you want to rapid oh. fire through them? Super Jeez, fast. She's freed. Okay, so part one is called Indigenous Songs of Lost Civilizations. I don't know why I didn't pick this up on my first read through, but I am realizing that all of the things, all of the planets that are mentioned here are planets that have been destroyed, which is very concerning because one of those things is the Old Republic. And well, I'm I just mean, wondering, like, you know, Old Republic is obviously something that happened a while ago, but it's uh, it's kind of ominous in a way. It's like, what happened during the Old Republic to get rid of it? What happened? Yeah, the Old Republic and the Empire are the ones that are not, like, planets, but, like... But they're, like, eras. Yeah, eras. Yeah, but great these, stuff. Let's, let's go through them really quick, because they're all... right, you start all, first. Because I love the music. All right. Naval Hymns of the Old Republic. Love it. Silt Sea, Threnody, Necronus Burial Song. R.I.P. Necronus. The Kuntavarian Fall, Ballad from an Unknown Province, R.I.P. to the Unknown Province. Love Songs of the Kortaka Riverlands, R.I.P. to the Kortaka Riverlands. Night Vigils of the Polis Massa Religious Cast, R.I.P. Polis Massa. <laughs> oh, wow. I did not need to know Polis Massa was destroyed somewhere along the line. The place, yeah. where, Pad- the place where Padme Amidala gave birth to Luke and Leia. Holy Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that rip- was, I was like, I recognize that. <laughs> rip, rip the Uba droid. Oh, God. May she rest Uba. in peace. The seven algorithmic etudes of Vardos. Uh, which, Vardos? That's, that, was, that was how you figured it out. Yeah. We saw Vardos get destroyed in Battlefront 2. All right. Next one. R.I.P. Vardos. The Royal Anthem of Alderaan. Oh, oh, Jesus Christ. Ouch. R.I.P. Alderaan. Glory of the Empire, the Imperial March, which we hear, which <laughs> we, we hear in Solo, A Star Wars Story. Yeah. When, and Ho- we, when Han gets enrolled in the Empire, he hears the dun, 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 dun on the TV. Oh, God, love that. We yeah. Love that and we do story. not have to say R.I.P. the, uh, the, the Empire because uh, they can go. Yeah, because get up the Empire. Get up. <laughs> I'm so glad you're on the same page on that. Okay. You go <gasps> next. Right. You got All right, one. so in the spirit of Rebels Remembered today on March 5th when we were recording, I want to talk about Hera because yes, Hera played what? a very, very, very important part in this book. Yeah. And she mentioned a lot of times she made a reference to Jason Sindula wanting to go home and give him a mother rather than somebody with a keen tactical mind because she wants this to be her last ba- uh, battle. And she also wants to see Jason Sindula grow into a man as kind and noble as his father. 
she felt satisfied with her life as a rebel. So just right there, you see that she's kind of winding down uh, her life as a rebel. She really just wants to sip some Mai Tais on the beach with her son. And I love at 1.2, where she thinks to herself, careful Hera, Hubris will kill you faster than the sabotage droids. Don't assume you'll see the end of this war. And in my mind, I actually read that in Freddie Prince Jr.'s voice. And I think that is actually my headcanon is that that is actually Kanan talking to her through the force. And that's the voice that she hears. It's not her own voice because it says that, you know, she felt that in the, like a knife in her heart, but it did the trick and she was alert again from it. So I think that's kind of Kanan reminding her like, you know, careful Hera. That's how he would say it. Exactly. (laughs) But one other thing to note, and I'll let you get to the, the part I know you want to talk about with Hera, but she does say, that, you know, she got very good at not thinking about certain subjects like, quote, absent friends. Oh, who can it be? Who can it be? I don't know. She also has, quote, personal business, end quote, to take care of before she settles down. So uh, I think the absent friend could be Ezra Bridger. It could, could it? be Sabine. Maybe could it's it? been a long time since she's been reunited. Um, where is Zeb at? You know, I think the ghost crew is split up pretty severely right now. So it makes me wonder, you know, what is in the works for a Rebel sequel? You know, it seems like the Ghost crew has been very separated for quite some time. And so I think the perfect thing that might bring them all together is the search for Ezra Bridger. And um, holy crap, what a story that would be if uh, they all reunite to find and complete their family. Like, that would be amazing. Sarah, speaking of the Ghost crew. Yeah. Tell me about the Ghost. The Ghost? You mean, the ghost. You mean my jaw dropping and me <laughs> quite literally going to the floor to cry when the Crazy. ghost showed up? I was like, I, I mean, this one, this one felt like a little bit of like a, I sprinkled this in for you, kind of a, like, a, like <laughs> not like me specifically, but like this one's for the fans kind of a, a moment because it's, it's so ridiculous. Like, wh- why would the ghost be on the Star Destroyer? But also like, thank God the ghost is on the Star Destroyer. And oh my God. The ghost at the Battle of Jakku. It's everywhere. Oh, my God. (laughs) It's everywhere. And also, like, it's still around. Like, she still has it. Like, incredible. It has some upgrades, too. I love it. I, what a joy. What a joy seeing that ship name was. And I'm so sorry if the the audio in this particular section is just really loud. Because we're just screaming and happy about about everything. Yeah, It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Amazing. Loved it. Okay. Keep going. (laughs) Uh, You take the next one, Sarah. Prequel Renaissance. Uh... Clone Wars hyperspace docking ring that uh, Soren Keys docks his TIE fighter in? <laughs> what the heck? Buzz droids and ti- TIE fighters? And Brad had the audacity yesterday to ask me if I knew what a TIE fighter was. Um, Listen, this, is, this is what happens to women fans in Star Wars, but also no. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I was a- gatekeeping TIE fighters yesterday you were, from you. <laughs> you were. But jokes on Brad, I had a Tri Fighter toy as a kid, and it was my favorite thing. <laughs> so um, let you take the next one because I know this was really mind blowing when it came up. Yeah. So the one of the ships that is orbiting Coruscant as part of the blockade of the planet, which is holding the planet hostage, is called the Panaka. The Panaka. The Panaka. After the Panaka. Uh, after Panaka, Phantom Menace Panaka who protects Padme Panaka. So it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, they try to take down Soren Keys and have him dock. And, you know, he snidely remarks, if I recall my history, Moff Panaka was instrumental in breaking his homeworld's blockade, not preserving it. And I was like, damn, Soren Keys saw the Phantom Menace? What? <laughs> but I also, love this shout out. It made me remember of that chapter in Leia, Princess of Alderaan. Yeah. Ugh. That reveal, that reveal Ugh. was like, We're gonna having the knowledge, one. Have the knowledge, having the knowledge of Leia, Princess of Alderaan, and reading that moment, it was like, oh, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a lot yeah. of layers to this one, for sure. All right, you take the next one. Go for it. And lastly, we want to get inside Alexander Freed's brain. So on our, our Shadowfall episode, we talked about some of the things that were brought up that were kind of interesting to us, that were some unique terminology. Yeah. So uh, one of those was uh, when Chas... You know, how Alphabet Squadron is now some sort of conglomeration of, you know, Flare Squadron, Hail Squadron, so on and so forth. She jokingly says Alphabet and Friends, Alphabet Plus, which everything is being named something plus nowadays. So oh. I'm a fan of Alphabet Plus. I like Alphabet, I like Alphabet and Friends. It feels yeah. like the name of a children's book that I would read. 
Alphabet Plus, you know, I would just imagine like it's a streaming service where there's just like a dash cam in everybody's cockpit. <gasps> Just and, like, kidding, I'm I just, signing up for that. I just get to just watch anybody I want. Like, oh, I'm going to tune into Will Lark's A-Wing and just, you know, check what out, check out what he's doing. Oh, that would be kind of cool. Mood, mood. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we all need that. Okay, the next one, just lots of weird names. The Circus of Mortal Appetites. Mm. Ink Spotted Lord, Keeper of Secrets, and the Chamber of Lusty Hollows, which oh. there's <laughs> implications there. There um, are some massive implications there. <laughs> but i love it i love it all like when the circus of mortal appetites came up in the beginning of this book i was like what a name what a name knocking it out of the park again we got some more music names we have Hey-o. zabrak concertista which i think was in shadowfall actually yak corzum queen of echo wave except maybe quote the song i hate the reefs and you dearest x iconic great name for a song and then last week, we just have like a really, really sexy word choice. This is like the only word I highlighted in the entire book for some reason, because I've literally never seen this word. And I'm just really? like, Alex Freed, do you just have a dictionary on you at all times? Because this is just brilliant stuff. He probably. knows big words. I'll do like the spelling bee version, you know? The word is braggadocio. Can you use it in a sentence? <laughs> I actually can't. <laughs> Can you give me the etymology of that word? Or the origin of the word? <laughs> use it in a sentence uh i think i pulled up a sentence it's, it's a word to seem like mer- very or bragging a lot that yeah very pompous yeah boasting arrogant uh if you want to use it in a sentence the air of swaggering braggadocio that all important men are expected to show in fighting that yeah. is off of web marion webster so thank you mary webster um yeah great great stuff i this also learned some choice. new words in this this book yeah um and i love that for myself and i love that my ipad has a dictionary built in it makes my life really easy um but yeah we love fun word choice and something that allows us to see the frame of you know what the picture of what's going on a little bit differently or a little bit more um intricately so love it 10 out of 10 and lastly sarah one final thought here will lark being a senator the implications there are is, is that he works at some point. This is my headcanon. He works with Leia Organa in the Senate. Yeah. Will Lark, at some point in his lifetime, will meet Leia and work with Leia. And Leia's going to meet Will Lark and they're going to be best friends. Oh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. They've already met at this point. Because, yeah. Six years later. I mean, come on. Because for sure. You know, Alphabet Squadron is not that far from Hera, not that far from Mothma. And now he's a senator in the government, uh, under in Mothma's government, and so it's, I already I say it's already happened. It's already happened. Crazy, crazy stuff. It's yeah. just it's mind blowing. Honestly, amazing to think about. Give me more of those political books, please. I would uh, give me like, oh my god, I would like a Will Lark reconciliation project book. Just, uh, the politics of it all, the the good please. feelings of it all, like the the tough emotions of it all. Oh, I, I want it. I want oh. it. I'll eat it up for sure. Alexander Freed, if you would like to write another book with some of these characters, I would not say no. Thank you. <laughs> That's just the facts. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sarah, you know, as we as we say goodbye to Alphabet Squadron, you know, I want to ask you, we know there is an alleged figure called Alphabet 2 who yeah. shows up at the Battle of Exegol and the Rise of Skywalker novelization. So one would presumably think Alphabet 2 is a member of Alphabet Squadron because that is just way too specific. So who do you think Alphabet 2 is now that we know everybody's alive? Who do you think the most realistic choice is for Alphabet 2? So I We don't know. About- By the way, we don't know. We haven't told each other who we think. So this is our first time. Okay. I've thought about it a lot. And I didn't come to a conclusion until just now. I think it's Chas. Ooh. Yep. Because I think Alphabet Leader in this situation is Quell. Ooh, you think she takes back the mantle of Alphabet Leader? For this, I think she does. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go with that. That's my answer. I'm locking it in. What's your answer? (laughs) Okay. Yeah. My answer mm-hmm. is Nath Tenzin. 
I didn't expect you to say that. Oh my god, tell me more. <laughs> I, you know, I think this, I think he's a Han Solo type. I really Ooh. do. I think he wants to, you know, like Han Solo wanted to lead the smuggling life. Nath wants to be a pirate. But god damn it, Nath, he's going to get pulled right back into the freaking rebellion and the resistance. And he's just, you know, the resistance, when you think about it, they kind of stem off from the New Republic because, you know, the New Republic doesn't believe that, you know, shit's going on with the First Order and then they all face the price for it because Hazian Prime gets blown up, blown up. So I think Hazian Prime getting blown up is going to be the wake up call for Nath Tenzin. And uh, he is going to show up to the final fight and say, listen, this is when it matters the most. I, I know I've kind of spent all my chances in my life. And I've talked about how, you know, when you're on a hot streak, you call it in, you cash your cards in and you fold. You fold your hand. You know, the fact that all five of us got out of this alive is impressive. That's it for me. I think he's just going to get pulled right back in because when he sees the rest of Alphabet Squadron, I think there's an Alphabet 3 and a 4 and a 5. I think, you think everybody's you think I, so? think ev- I think everybody's there. So I had this thought while we've been talking about um, Hosni and Prime. Oh, don't say the words. <laughs> I won't say them, but I had the thought. He was, he was uh, taking a field trip. Will Lark was taking a field trip that day. <laughs> <laughs> it scared me. The thought scared me and I didn't like it. <laughs> Please, God. Oh, my God. I take it back. But I think, but I think you're Don't even decide. speak those words. How dare you even speak, put the thought I, in I, my I, head? I'm not saying them. I'm not saying them. I'm just saying I had a thought, okay? Um, but I think, I, I think that... Oh, my God. I think that Eureka is the one who is alphabet leader and pulls yeah. whoever she pulls back into the fight because she, she's like, we, we have to go one more time. We have to continue to fight for justice. You know, I will say Will Lark is also a good guess because, you know. know, it says That's he, ra- he rarely, say. he rarely flew. So, you know, when would he make an exception is to kind of fight the final fight, you know. I didn't yeah. fight at Jakku, but I'll fight here with my friends. Yeah, I could see it happening as well. Yeah. Um, but my number one guess is Nath because I yeah. like to think the good in him would overcome all else and he'll, he'll crawl his way back. He can't resist it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think... Alexander Freed as an author, you know, we talked a lot about him up front on the show. I I really think for him, he will return to the Star Wars universe, I would imagine. I think he's kind of proven himself to be somebody who deserves to take on a High Republic book. And I think as we kind of close out phase one of the High Republic, my prediction is phase two will have a bunch of new authors. Phase three will have a bunch of new authors. And I think that, you know, Alexander Freed will be one of the primary authors for phase two i think he will probably write something maybe from a military perspective of like the republic defense coalition and kind of show that side of things during the high republic because we you know we've only seen the jedi and the nile but you know we haven't gotten to explore some of the military aspects of of this era yet so i would like to see him write a book about that coalition and i think that would be pretty cool pretty uh, like a unique perspective he could bring specifically given his track record yeah that's that's really interesting i was also thinking today about how i think they might switch authors in the second and third phases not to slight any of the current authors they're obviously all excellent amazing Mm -hmm. but i i i do wonder if they're going to stick through all like five years of this project because that's that's a huge huge commitment um so I, I don't know. It'll be really interesting to see if we get that. I am of the firm belief that I would like Alexander Freed to write whatever the heck he wants to write. <laughs> Literally anything he wants to write, I will read it. Um, because he just has a way of doing things that is different than any other author that I have ever read. And I am here for his vision. I am here for what he has to say. I am here for his characters. And... I am ready for more, and I would love to get more of these characters if he was ever willing or able to write them. I would love to get him writing more in this time between the Empire and the New Republic uh, in the, in that 30 years. I think it would be super interesting for him to delve into more of the emotions on the political side, more of the emotions of everyday people. There's just something about it. It's really good, and I would be happy to read wherever he decides to go next or whether he's able to go wherever he's able to go next yes i agree sarah give alexander free the world and definitely give him a high republic book because uh the guy deserves it and yeah i think you know most likely they should switch authors because it kind of gives more people a chance 
uh, to play in that sandbox. That seems fair. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of proven authors in Star Wars right now. He has shown he can do it. Um, he's incredible. He's incredible. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. But Sarah, what are your closing thoughts on Alphabet Squadron? Finally, you know, what are the final things that you would like to say about Victory's Price? About this trilogy? How do you want to say goodbye? Um, I would like to say thank you. And that might sound a little sentimental or silly, but I am very sentimental about this series. I would just like to say thank you to Alexander Freed uh, for creating these characters and letting us go on a journey with them. I would like to thank the team at Del Rey for supporting this project and making it amazing. And I would like to thank the person who designed the covers of these books. Um, They're awesome. They look great on my shelf. I love staring at them. They're so compelling. I just would like to express how grateful I am for this story. And it, to me, it is something that I am so glad I went on the journey with and feel is such a beautiful story. Uh, dare I say a masterwork. Dare I. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah, I, I, I feel really good about it. And I haven't felt like this about things in a while and so to feel just good about it is a really great feeling yeah you know i want to say uh thank you to alexander as well for crafting these characters and just showing that there is something to be said about new original characters that you know i can care as much about erica quill as i do han solo you know i can care about these characters just as much as anybody on screen this these stories gave us some of the most authentic characters in Star Wars, some of the most emotionally compelling ones, the ones that we could resonate with the most. Um, five different characters that we could resonate, especially you know not just one central protagonist. This was an ensemble book, like you said, an ensemble series, and the fact that each of them had a completely fleshed out arc that was emotionally satisfying and had a happy ending. The fact that he executed it, honestly, is like, uh, again, I might be exaggerating, you know, I might just be kind of, uh, kind of fanboying here, but like, I really do think, uh, it's not something you get to see all the time, uh, especially in Star Wars, you know, a story about atonement and freedom. So thank you to Alexander. Thank you to Del Rey too, for, you know, sending us copies to, to read and review on here. And I think I had a blast doing it, Sarah. And for those of you listening, if you want to hear more coverage, this is actually not the end. Next Monday, we'll be posting our upcoming interview with the author himself, Alexander Freed. So on Monday, March 15th, that is when you will get our episode on with him. So we're going to ask him a lot of fun Woo! questions, talk about this book. And <laughs> so uh, I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm really excited to have him back on the show. He was on last summer. So and now you're joining me, Sarah. This is going to be our first book author interview together. So uh, it'll yeah. be fun. Missed it last year, um, wasn't able to join in on that interview, so I'm really glad to be here this year and to, to get to talk about this series in full and just about uh, his work on Victory's Price. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so thrilled and I hope that uh, you will all tune in next week um, for, for this interview. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that seems about wrap it up, Sarah. We, <laughs> we have... Uh... You we're, know, not we, talk, we, we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> our, our time on this episode is pretty, uh, pretty wild. Uh, we had a lot of emotions on this book. I actually think we could have talked about this book for six hours, to be quite frank. Oh, 100%. So, yeah, so I, I'm impressed we, that we, we cut it We pared it down. <laughs> and even then, we didn't really pare it down at all. Like, uh, yeah. I'm so sorry. First of all, I apologize to you. Second of all, <laughs> thank you for being my friend and not hating me for doing that. <laughs> like, sitting here talking about it for so long. No, this is a lot of fun, and it felt like the uh, the right way to send off the the series. So, Sarah, where can our listeners find you online? You can find me at seh221 on Twitter, Goodreads, and Letterboxd, and at Sarah's Puzzle Pages on Instagram, where I do books and puzzles and things. And I posted today my book stack with my Alphabet Squadron trilogy of books, so you can find that there and on Twitter and um. I really like taking pictures of books. I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> and also, I love these books, so I am hugging them in the photo. It's fine. Yes, they deserve a hug for sure. As for Friends of the Force, uh, we just posted some brand new artwork from Mariana Avila featuring Sarah. She is part of the podcast artwork. Now we are I dressed in High Republic robes. It is <laughs> amazing. So cool. 
So <laughs> if so you upset. haven't already <laughs> seen it, definitely check it out. It's on our website at friendsoftheforestpod.com. You can also find the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Make sure to drop a, a review and a rating wherever you listen to the podcast and subscribe to us so you get all the latest episodes as soon as they're up. Thank you to our current patrons, Anna, Brian, Cheryl, Deborah, Donnie, Ella G, Jesse, Knights of Ren, Levi, Lindsay, Marie Claire, Neil, Rachel, Sarah, and T. That's patreon.com slash friends of the force, where you can help support the show for only $1 a month, and it helps the show keep up with all of our hosting fees and all of that stuff to make the show possible. So thank you for your support. Thank you for everybody who listened to this episode and stayed through this entire thing. We God hope you bless enjoyed you. it. God bless your soul. You are the true friends of the forces. <laughs> friends of the force. Oh man, <laughs> words are becoming harder, Sarah. We gotta shut this down quick. Oh no. For all of you listening, again, thank you so much. And until next week, may the force be with you always. <laughs>